Only being offered money to be in reform. <laughs> exactly. Do you think that these um, out there politicians like Gert Wilders have to have big hair? I think I think they should. Yeah. Yes. I'm thinking about the Argentinian guy. He's yeah, got yeah. Big he's hair. got big hair. He's got chin salt. <laughs> Boris had big hair. Big hair. It's, it se seems to help. Right. Maybe. Uh, well, Richard Tice has got big hair. There you go. Just saying. Um, we see Nigel Farage's. Oh, no, no, no one should see that. Uh, it sounds like, oh, that's not where I want to leave this show. Uh, Peter, I hope the show goes very well. Thank so, you. That sounds uh, really good indeed. Dr Rennie, thank you very much. Are you it's bothering to come in next weekend? I will. Oh, that's very nice of you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, this is Talk TV. Peter Caldwell is up next. This is Talk TV. It's the world's number one interview show, the new global home of big debates and big questions. This is really unfair. Why? We'll explain why. For all the big names. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. You're going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, of course, I cannot continue my work. Did you feel Elvis was a controlling influence on you? And the good news? You've already found it. All new Piers Morgan Uncensored, right here, Monday to Thursday, 8 p.m. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They're that right. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. TV.
Well, a very good morning. I'm Peter Cardwell. An absolute pleasure to have your company this Sunday morning. Thank you for tuning in, whether it's on Talk TV or indeed on Talk Radio. It's an absolute pleasure, as I say, to have you with me. Hopefully between 9 and 1 o'clock, there's loads to talk about. There's a big march against anti-Semitism in London today. Dr. Renee has just told me she's going on it. And uh, I know a number of other people here at Talk TV are as well. There was, of course, anti-Semitism to combat, including yesterday at the pro-Palestinian march. There were arrests because of what people were up to there. We're going to hear more about that. We also have the very good news that at least some of the Israeli hostages have been released uh, in uh, exchange for some Palestinian prisoners. A little girl called Emily Hand, who is half uh, Israeli, half Irish, has been released. Very weird tweet by the Irish Foreign Minister, Leo Varadkar, saying she was lost and now she's found. Uh, of course, she was kidnapped by Hamas terrorists. We'll be talking about that. We'll also be talking about what the latest is in the Middle East, going to our regular correspondent, Yodham Confino, to find out what's happening there. We'll have the big debate about Number 10 moving to quell the Tory backlash after the Home Secretary's Rwanda comments, surging immigration numbers this week as well. Uh, we'll talk about the BBC as well. Jeremy Bowen, their most senior uh, reporter, I think international editor is his title. He, of course, is in Israel quite a lot, admitting that Israel reporting was wrong, but I have no regrets. Uh, we'll also be talking about train drivers setting, uh, set to strike ahead of Christmas. They can earn salaries up to £100,000, and apparently there's no stress in their job. Wouldn't that be nice? Lots to talk about as well in terms of uh, the uh, Dutch elections. We have uh, Gerd Wilders has become the uh, leader of the largest party now in the Netherlands. Will he become Prime Minister? That looks unlikely because we've had centrist governments there for a while, but the, the, uh, he is certainly on the right. He says that the Netherlands is full up. We'll be getting the latest on him and what he's saying and whether there could be other uh, European nations that go the same way. It's interesting as well because he has talked about Nexit, about the Netherlands exiting the EU. We'll see if that happens. Also, I'll be talking to, about the uh, village army catching speeders with police radar guns. The police have given these local people uh, radar guns to catch speeders. Would you be happy to be caught by one? And almost half of women on trans tra transport workers have been sexually harassed in the past year. We'll also be uh, finding out who the rescue animal of the week is with Check Up Dave, of course, a little bit later on. And just before we start, I want to say a very, very happy 74th birthday to my father, Ken Cardwell. It is his birthday today, the 26th of November, so very happy birthday to him and uh, he's got a lovely birthday present coming tomorrow in that he's getting Rosie the Cat, his uh, rescue cat from my friend Yvette, that's happening, I was talking about that yesterday he, uh, my dad and his mystery female companion, who shall remain nameless because I'm not allowed to talk about her on the air my mother, anyway, they're getting Rosie tomorrow which is very exciting and happy birthday to my dad let's spend the next few hours together here on the Well, she has finally come back to us, says the family of Emily Hand, the uh, Irish girl, uh, Irish Israeli girl who was kidnapped by Hamas terrorists 50 days ago, 50 days of hell. 20 prisoners were exchanged for 39 Palestinian prisoners. Let's talk to Eli Kraft, who is a senior communications officer with the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism. And I know, Eli, that you are involved with the big march in London today. And uh, I hope that goes really, really well. I know there are people here at this station who are going to be on that march as well, including uh, Dr. Renee Hunderkamp, who is uh, helping David Bill present the programme this morning. So um, can I just get your reaction, first of all, to the fact that Emily Hand is back with her family? Yeah, absolutely. And first of all, Peter, thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, it's fantastic that Emily has been reunited with her family. It's been a very long time coming, and I'm sure the family are absolutely elated with the news. Of course, it is an atrocity that any of this ever happened in the first place, but it is absolutely fantastic and an entire uh, nation of people are now breathing a sigh of relief that she is back. Absolutely, certainly in Ireland, but for those in Israel and many other countries as well, there are still hostages that are being, uh, that are, well, that are under the, the uh, that are being held captive by Hamas, uh, which is horrendous. I mean, how optimistic are you that things will move in the direction of getting all those hostages back because we have seen at least some progress over the last few days but of course at a big cost as well listen i all we can do is remain optimistic that's all we can do if we lose that we have we have nothing just like everyone else i am waiting with bated breath and praying that all of the hostages are released safely i know that people are doing everything they can and you know like everyone else 
I'm, I'm just praying that everyone gets home safely. Eli, there was a really, just speaking of Emily Hahn, there was a really weird tweet. I just want to show it on the screen now if you're watching on Talk TV. I'll read it out for people who are listening on Talk Radio. It was from Leo Varadkar, the Irish Foreign Minister, who used to be the um, Taoiseach, the Irish Prime Minister. He said, it is, a, it is a day of enormous joy and relief for Emily Hahn and her family. An innocent child who was lost has now been found and returned, and we all breathe a massive sigh of relief. Our prayers have been answered. A very weird language has been lost and now is found. I mean, she was kidnapped by Hamas terrorists. Very, very strange, Eli. And I just wonder about some of the language around this conflict as well, because, you know, words matter. It's so incredibly important to get the language right and to call things what they are. Hamas are terrorists. She was kidnapped. Uh, she was returned and she should never have been taken in the first place. Well, 100%. And the word lost makes it seem like she just wound up there. Or the just, just wandered is, off in Tesco's or something. I mean, it was just, exactly. you know, yeah. As if there's no agency from, from Hamas it's stealing, you know, stealing away, kidnapping a nine-year-old girl. Well, as you say, words matter. Let's, let's call them what they are. Hamas are anti-Semitic, genocidal, terrorist murderers. And to do anything that they have done is... Is I, I can't even fathom the sort of person you have to be in order to to do that. And when you say things like Emily was lost, it feeds into this narrative that Hamas are not anti-Semitic yeah. genocidal terrorists, which they are. And we need to call that out, and we need to say that what it is. Um, I want I know you, you you are involved a little bit with the march later on today, as are many uh, organisations like yours, and I hope it goes really well. Um, yesterday, of course, there was the pro Palestinian another pro Palestinian march. Flares were set off in Trafalgar Square in breach of police advice. Uh, marchers uh, repeated chants of "From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free," which is obviously a very anti-Semitic phrase. Um, there are all sorts of things. There have been arrests as well uh, because of anti-Semitic banners and so on this just doesn't get any better does it Eli? no not particularly and the idea that it is getting better is is perhaps not entirely true in addition to everything you mentioned we put out a video last night that has footage of things that went on there were also calls for an intifada there were calls for armies to rise up and this sort of language doesn't really strike me of one of peace uh, let's be honest, London has become a no-go zone for Jews every single Saturday. If you're a Jewish person and you're walking through London and you're hearing chants of from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, which calls for the eradication of Israel from the River Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea, um, you're probably not going to feel very safe. You're probably not wanting to uh, go there. And so this idea that these are actually it, like in the hand and peace marches perhaps isn't actually that accurate. I also want to say, actually, we have a great rivalry, of course, with GB News, and uh, we, there are there are great rivals, I think, anyway. Some people may not think that, but there is a journalist there called Catherine Forster who is a political correspondent, and I know Catherine. She's a very nice person, and she's a very good reporter as well, and she was reporting uh, down in central London. She was harassed, uh, horrendous uh, harassment and real intimidation by uh, people who were on that march as well. And listen, you know, GB News may be our rival, but Catherine, uh, I, I just I just want to say to you, if you're watching, we have absolute solidarity with you in terms of doing your job. Journalists should be allowed to tell the truth, should be allowed to go to those marches without fear of any harassment or any uh, any uh, f problem with uh, them broadcasting there. And we want we want her to continue to have a, an amazingly successful career, as I know she has, and to continue doing the work that she's doing really, really well. And Eli, I think it's just horrendous that even, even journalists simply saying this is what's happening have been harassed at these marches as well well of course it's absolutely uh ridiculous that that is happening journalists must be allowed to do their job and i want to assure any journalists if they're coming to our march today which starts at 1 30 outside the royal courts of justice you will be absolutely warmly welcomed by our team we would love to speak with you nobody is going to harass you and i really think that that alone demonstrates the real difference in the marches that we have seen yesterday versus today i'm going to make a prediction about the number of people arrested in your march. I think it's going to be zero. 
I think it's going to be peaceful and I think you're going to make your points very, very well. Eli, I wish you well later on um, and I hope it goes very, very well without any incident. And uh, I know the point that you're making is one that I certainly believe in and that anti-Semitism is always wrong, is never acceptable. Um, Eli, thank you very, very much indeed for that. Uh, let's go to uh, Israel, actually, and our regular correspondent, Yotam Confino, is uh, with us now. Uh, Yotam, it's just 24 hours since we spoke, of course, but lots has happened because there have been eight people killed in the uh, West Bank by Israeli uh, forces, apparently, and uh, we've also seen the this prisoner exchange. Just bring us up to date with what's happened in the last 24 hours, Yotam. Indeed, a lot of uh, developments, Peter. First of all, Hamas has can now confirm that four of its senior commanders were indeed killed in Israeli airstrikes. Now, that's, of course, prior to the ceasefire. So they're now admitting that. And in the West Bank, as you said, the Israeli military is conducting raids still against uh, terrorists. And uh, the reason why it's doing that is because the ceasefire uh, stipulates that it's only between Hamas and Israel and Gaza. It actually doesn't encompass uh, the West Bank. And in addition to that, we're also hearing uh, a lot of criticism now, especially from the, from, the, from the families who received the hostages yesterday, in particular one. There's a 13-year-old girl who was released without her mother. Now, according to the ceasefire, all children have to be released with their mothers if their mothers are indeed alive and kept in Gaza. So that uh, community from which they come from have been extremely angry that she was released without her mother. Yes, of course, and that will just add, I'm sure, to a lot of the uh, a lot of the anguish out there. Absolutely, it doesn't make it better that uh, the minute that Palestinian prisoners were released from Israeli jail, they were met with uh, crowds of Hamas supporters in the West Bank. Some of them chanting um, Mohammed Deif, which is the military commander of Hamas's military wing. Uh, they were chanting his name, and they were. Wild basically just saying, let's continue what uh, they started, Hamas, on October 7th. It's, it's really a difficult situation right now, and especially because Israel feels as if there's, been, there's made this sort of equivalence between the hostages in Gaza and the prisoners in Israeli jails. It's, it's a very weird uh, phenomenon that is also being, it's a narrative that's kind of being repeated in the media. It's it's really really awful that there's such an such a comparison. I don't know how anyone can see a 10 month old baby and an 18 year old uh, member of Hamas as two equal partners. It, it it simply isn't. Well, there's also been quite a lot of selective uh, reporting, uh, not by you, Yotam, of course, but by uh, perhaps people with less. Uh, less scrupulous journalism saying, oh, look at this 16-year-old uh, Palestinian who was uh, detained by the Israelis. Yeah, that 16-year-old girl um, actually stabbed an Israeli. Uh, so, I mean, listen, there, there is, you know, there, we, need to, we need to keep the facts correct here. I also want to ask you just about Emily Hand, and of course she has uh, really captured a lot of the imagination in the press on, in this part of the world because she is Irish Israeli. And sorry, I, I, I got it wrong earlier. Leif Riker is, of course, the Taoiseach, the Irish Prime Minister. He switched with um, my, uh, Michal Martin, who is now the foreign minister. And uh, Leo Riker has, uh, has put this very, quite weird tweet out. I don't know if you're familiar with it, Yotam, where he said that um, Emily Hand was lost and is now found. Now, I think, as uh, Keith, Keith in Merseyside has mentioned, that uh, it might be a reference to the uh, sort of prodigal son in the Bible. And I can understand that, I suppose, if that is what he's trying to do. But it is quite weird to say that she's been lost and is now found. I mean, she was kidnapped by Hamas terrorists. I wonder if this is on your radar, Yotam. Absolutely. And the, the foreign minister of Israel even uh, condemned it. He said, I think your moral compass is a bit off, to put it mildly. Uh, and again, it, it might be that the intention is good, but... You are the head of state. You should think twice before you put out anything that has to do with such a sensitive issue. And again, this is not, it's not, it, this is not an isolated incident. This happens constantly. And there is constantly this framing of two equal uh, enemies, Hamas and Israel, as if they are absolutely equal. They do the same things. It's, it's quite astonishing, really, because had, it been, had Emily been kidnapped by Islamic State in Iraq, I guarantee you that it wouldn't have been the, the same message that had come out. So I think it's really time for some soul searching. And this is not me trying to say that Israel is uh, the better part in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This has nothing to do with that. But we're talking about Israel and Hamas here. 
There has to be some soul searching when you think about a terrorist organization, genocidal terrorist organization, and a state that is trying to defend itself. Now, you can absolutely criticize Israel for what it's doing in Gaza, and you should absolutely. And the IDF, the Israel military, also has a long history of not telling the truth. But again, these statements have to be a little bit more carefully uh, put out. It's extremely sensitive. It's a nine-year-old girl. She wasn't lost and found. She was taken by Hamas. Absolutely. And Ted has tweeted and said, thank you for highlighting the idiotic use of language by Leo Varadkar saying uh, the Irish Hamas kidnap victim saying she had been lost. Why does he hate the Irish so much? Well, I don't believe Leo Varadkar hates the Irish, but I think he should have used his language a bit better. Uh, Yotam, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for bringing us up to date on that. Apologies for getting the facts wrong on Leo Varadkar. They, they've moved around a lot because uh, his party... Uh, Fina Gale is in coalition with Fina Fall. Uh, another uh, historically, they're big rivals, but they're in coalition and they've moved around a few times. I, I just uh, got it wrong there. He is, of course, the Irish Prime Minister, the uh, Taoiseach, which means Irish chieftain, uh, or which means chieftain in Irish anyway. And uh, Michal Martin is the Foreign Minister. So that is uh, what's happened. So it is a very weird tweet. Let us know your reaction to this or indeed any of the stories that we're talking about today. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. You can text me 87. With the word talk in your text, or you can uh, tweet me at Talk TV or follow me at Peter Cardwell as well. Nicola in Norfolk, thank you for your message. She says, uh, Peter, really nice to hear you speaking up for Catherine Forster. What happened to her and her crew was appalling and unacceptable. Yes, I've got to remember the crew as well. And it's actually, um, it's not just the reporter, it's also the people uh, with her, maybe a producer, maybe a, a, a cam uh, certainly a cameraman or a camera woman who is often looking into the camera and can't really see what's around as well. And if someone is coming up behind, behind you or um, or attacking you in some way. I've been in riot situations as a reporter. I know this wasn't a riot per se, but just those situations where you don't feel entirely comfortable. But Nicola says, uh, really nice to hear you speaking up for Catherine Forster. What happened to her and her crew was appalling and unacceptable. Yes, Talk TV and GB News are rivals, but I hope it is friendly rivalry because you're the only two channels which speak up for common sense and the silent majority and ask the questions which need asking, but which the mainstream media studiously avoid asking. Well done and thank you. Well, thank you, Nicola. That is a very kind thing to, to, to uh, text in. Jane has said, morning Peter, the reason why we have uh, fewer boats is because of the weather. Nothing the Prime Minister has done. He has no intention of stopping the boats. He needs to stop spinning this nonsense. The voters are not falling for it. Well, we're actually going to talk, that, talk about that a bit more with our panel in a minute. On train drivers, Mick has been in touch and says, try to get a job as a train driver. You'll be lucky to get an interview as it's a closed shop. Keep it in the family, says Mick. Uh, Rumi in North Buckinghamshire says, good morning Peter. Uh, can you find out why Jews who have marched in the pro, pro ceasefire approval policy in March are saying they've been told they're not welcome on the march against anti-Semitism. I really wish someone would organise a march for peace that can bring people together, but perhaps this is fluffy idealism. Well, thank you for that. Plenty more to come, including our panel going through all the stories of the day and the week, Claire Muldoon and James Dowling, who's a former Treasury official. Stay with us here on Talk TV. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The 
weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, I'm just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Thanks to Gaza in Yorkshire, who's been in touch. He says, regarding the Free Palestine march yesterday and the past months, what they're chanting and the signs they're displaying, just show them for the extreme racist they are. Well, Gaza, I don't think all 100,000 people on a couple of weeks ago were uh, necessarily racist. Uh, there are definitely some racists, definitely some anti-Semites uh, anti in there, no doubt about that, but I wouldn't want to say every single person on that march is a racist. Anyway, uh, Gaza continues. It's taken months for the police to start to take action. I agree there will be the same behaviour at the march today. That's the uh, march against anti-Semitism starting at half one today. Dr. René is going on uh, as it comes down to their ideological views but watch out for opposition attending and causing chaos. Keep up the good work as you're one of the only uh, reporters left who talks on biased truth, says Gaza. Well, there we are. Well, two people who also talk on biased truth are James Dowling, a former Treasury official, former special advisor and indeed the commentator Claire Muldoon broadcaster with us here this morning. Hello. Morning, how are you? Very well. Good. Nice to see you both. Excellent. Good to see you both. We want to get your reaction to a lot of things but actually one thing that a lot of people are talking about today is uh, Leo Varadkar, the um, Irish Prime Minister, the Taoiseach's reaction to the fact that the hostage horror is, thank goodness, over for some people. Of course, it continues mm -hmm. for others, and we must never forget that. But the uh, Israeli-Irish uh, girl, Emily Han, she's nine years old. She's been reunited with her uh, father. This is quite a strange tweet where he says she was lost and is now found. Uh, a reference, as Keith in Manchester pointed out in text, perhaps to the prodigal son in the Bible. But, I mean, she wasn't lost. She was kidnapped by she Hamas terrorists. She was kidnapped terrorists. by terrorists and held hostage. I mean, lost and found. Was it a child lost in a supermarket? No, it wasn't. And the context of his remarks at the level of office that he holds, for me, is just totally abhorrent. Yeah. Really, really, really ill-judged and ill-communicated. Putting a, putting a tweet, like something like that, out on X. You know, what, what is this man on? Really? Very, very weird. Um, James, you advise ministers, if they were going to put out a tweet like that, uh, what would you have said? I... I, I think he he probably would regret doing that. I mean, I you know, look, I completely agree, completely mm. agree with Claire. I have to say, I think it was it was it was uh, to put it mildly, hit the wrong note. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and that's probably what it was. I mean, it, you know, the, the the intonation feels abhorrent, but I mean, he clearly he clearly didn't mean anything rather than just you know, thank God she's back and put it in incredibly mm. incredibly clumsy way. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, I was saying earlier, I feel quite uncomfortable. I mean, this obviously incredibly happy at this girl in, and and all the other hostages have come back but i feel quite uncomfortable mm. looking at the pictures of the hostages i can't I mean, look at them it's very i just think I really a, a nine-year-old girl in particular kind of i mean she must be incredibly girl. traumatized don't forget though but this nine-year-old girl we thought she was dead we thought yeah. she was murdered yeah and then you just how, have a, how awful must uh, our parents have felt during that period yeah. and now to realize she's still alive and now to be reunited yeah. with and her then she's i mean and she, the media who knows what she's gone through but, exactly you know, seven seven months in some kind of subterranean hellhole seven weeks sorry in subterranean subterranean hellhole comes out and then kind of her picture is all over the yeah. media she celebrated her birthday during that hostage yeah. um taking I mean, as well goodness me yeah, yeah. she's so nine just, 
And the yeah. whole family, I, feel... I mean, you know what the media are like. Mm. They're very, very intrusive. And this is a global story, obviously. Mm -hmm. And they, I don't think, I really hope and trust in God, actually, the family do have had enough support and training yeah. behind them that they will be able to deal with this because this is very harrowing. Yeah. You know, there well, were children have to be shielded. within the yeah. 39 hostages that were released. There were women and children um, kept there. And, you know, I just can't even begin to understand no. the terribleness no. of how they were held daily, captive. I mean, who knows what they went through, but the daily terror. Oh, I mean, yeah. James, and the, and the lack the, of hope. Yeah. They the, must have fallen yeah. And then the despair. hope for their families thinking, perhaps my relative will be the person getting out. Yes. Being released and then not... Not you know, it, and the guilt oh. that, that that you're a person. I mean, there's just it's the just hope, sort of the despair, the hope, the despair. Absolutely, we've got to remember as well that eight people have been killed by Israeli forces in the West Bank uh, as well. Uh, yesterday, um, um, that was uh, the Palestinian Health Ministry say five people were killed in Janine, three others killed in separate areas of yeah. the West Bank mm. since Saturday morning. So even though there is a ceasefire in Gaza, of course there is still uh, violence and clashes at various and various other parts. Of, uh, of Israel. We're going to leave Israel just for the, the minute um, because I want to have a look at what some of the uh, some of the senior politicians have been saying today. Laura Trott is the new Chief Secretary to the Treasury. She was on Sky News a little bit earlier. Let's see what she had to say. But they're both saying that it is part of the plan. It is not all of the plan. You know, we have successfully in the last year brought the numbers of people coming over here illegally down by a third. That is at a time when the numbers coming into Europe are up by 80%. This was not a foregone conclusion. It is because of actions that we have taken on uh, illegal immigration that the numbers have come down. And they will continue to do so because we are going to take steps like Rwanda to make sure that they come down further. All right. Well, there were, that was uh, Laura Trott there, who's the new Chief Secretary of the Treasury, Conservative, of course, and those, uh, those um, figures this week, the 745,000 people net migration, those are the legal uh, people who are here in this country uh, uh, over the course of the last year for which statistics are available. Well, Darren Jones, who is her shadow, the shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Labour politician, he was also on the media earlier. This is what he had to say where we're having to rely on a very, very high number um, of work visas from uh, workers overseas, especially in our health and social care system. Now, that contribution is very welcome. We wouldn't be able to keep the show on the road without them. Uh, but the Tories have to really think about how do you get to a position where you can provide the job opportunities and the training opportunities to people here in the UK first. So that is Darren Jones. A, a slightly, slightly harder line there from Darren Jones, actually, from Labour, Claire. Well, yes, but there's also a report in the Sun today that says that a lot of this legal um, migra net migration has been due to the issue of visas for students mm -hmm. and, you know, the urgent need for care workers, for care yeah. homes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there is a lot, but we've always known there's been a need for care workers. We always know there's, an, uh, there's the ability and the need for basic skilled um, workers in this country yeah. because a lot of us here are too work shy to take the jobs in the first place so therefore we have to rely on those that will come into the country to do it. And 40,000 care workers as well who were told to sling their hook because they wouldn't get the vaccine. Well, it's pretty appalling if exactly. you ask me. Exactly. You know, so there's a, really, it, it is, uh, isn't it? Yeah. It really, really is. Think, James, think, what do you think? Well, I think about a third of these, so of the you know nearly 750,000... Uh, Just come a little bit closer to the microphone. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, of the nearly 750,000, about a third are uh, are students, so yeah. they will go home. Never never really understood why why student numbers are included in net, net migration figures. But they but, often bring dependents to them. And they're often well, mature they, students they do, as well, they do, are they not? But, yeah. uh, but, you know... It, Higher education is a big export mm. industry for us. We should be, um, you know, there needs to be some way of thinking about that or contextualising that. And then, yes, you've got the healthcare workers. I mean, I think Darren Jones is quite interesting because essentially he is taking quite a hawkish line, in large part because, you know, let's face it, the kind of bit of the co of, of the Boris Johnson coalition that uh, is is most interested in the, this is also what is the Red Wall is also where Labour needs to win back. Mm. So, you know, he's going to have to pitch quite, they're ha going to have to pitch quite hard. And, you know, genuinely, I mean, I I have to say I'm I'm on the more liberal side on this, but I think it would be a, you know, I think those of us who are probably need to recognise that in the country at large there is a there, there is real real concern about migration. And I that's think there's real anger as well, yeah. James, because I, I mean it's not I, it's I, I think to have a conversation about about immigration isn't racist. It isn't not that you're saying it is obviously, no, no, but no. some people think it is. But I mean there are if you have seven hundred forty five thousand people coming into a country, I mean that's bigger than the size of the population of Manchester just just coming into a country, and that will of course have pressure on resources yes. and so on. So and that it, needs it is to, a real concern, and that needs to be managed. 
managed, and that needs to be managed in a sensible fashion, and that needs to be managed in terms of the allocation of resources to process it, which historically we haven't we done. We haven't done. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we've never had a history of but doing that. But shouldn't the people be allowed to come in in the first place? Well, Surely there should be greater controls. Well, I, I, I think my view is uh, that uh, probably we need probably we need uh, we do need some people. We need we need people in the healthcare in in the healthcare sector. You know, we simply do. And and if we don't have those, then uh, then then we're going to really struggle. You know, it's not like the NHS is thriving right now. Anyway, we're going to really struggle. Um, and. By the way, a lot, a lot of the, uh, a, a lot of the money that Hunt will have penciled in for the future forecast, his headroom that he's mm-hmm. given us back in, in in tax cuts, will be predicated on GDP growth. Some of which will be based on an, an assumption of migration. Now, you know, you can question whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it but is, is something. Migration we, we, not then a cost? Is he is he benchmarking mm-hmm. that, holding that as an asset to the country? Well, it's both, isn't it? It's it's uh, total total economic output, which mm-hmm. is a benefit, and then you need to pay for that in terms of the mm-hmm. resources and the infrastructure and that last bit. So you know, we don't resource we don't resource our entry well. We don't resource how we deal with how we deal with any anyone in this country really. We don't build enough houses as, as it stands, yeah. and the more people Absolutely you get in, you know, and the associated infrastructure. Mm-hmm. So there's a kind of wider issue there, and then relate and which inevitably therefore kind of you know generates a certain amount of public uh, communication. And, and then basically, course. the government has been terrible at, at, at publicly managing this. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I have to say, Suella Braverman has been awful at it. You know, she has fixated the entire policy on, on the most risky, the most divisive uh, aspect Isn't of she immigration just articulating control. articulating what some people can't, don't have well, a voice to say? In, in Are you her talking concern, about the, that, that place in Africa? I am talking about that place in Africa. Well, in how- her concern for uh, about the issue, it's perfectly reasonable to, vo- to voice it, to build the entire government's response on the most risky and the most divisive uh, policy, which may well fail, and then when it fails, you just look incompetent, is madness. I mean, it's political I mean, she has madness. Been, she has been Home Secretary for the last year uh, on, until, yeah. she was, until she was sacked, surely. I but she, she, made, has to but take she made that some point clear in her resignation letter, yeah. though. And I don't think she was particularly for it, to be fair, after reading that. Well, she said, she was, she said it was her dream to send people to Rwanda. Well, it feels yeah. quite pro. I mean, this is where I think her successor has proceeded a lot more cleverly. Uh, oh, I see oh, what you did oh, there. Get out, get out. Um, but, but even I, in his lexical choice, <laughs> come on. Um, so how has well, he proceeded yeah, more I mean, cleverly? Uh, in saying, I mean, you do. You've got you've got your number ten moves to quell to quell Tory backlash headline. Mm. In saying that, uh, you know, people should not fixate on on the, on the government's flagship Rwanda migration scheme, and people are going to fixate on it because mm. it's become such a thing. But actually, he has separately said it's not the be all and end all. What he's trying to do is make it part of a portmanteau response rather than the single yardstick of, uh, upon which success will be judged in this area. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. as if net numbers aren't enough. Well, um, exactly. Let me just read out a few uh, messages that we're getting on all sorts of issues. Um, ma- mainly, actually, uh, Rich in Brighton has pointed out, which I'd forgotten, that I uh, once was lost, but now I find is a quote from Amazing Grace, uh, which is, of course, a beautiful hymn. But was it, Rich, the most uh, appropriate thing for Leo Varadkar to tweet at this time, given that she was she was kidnapped? I think uh, you're, you're right on that, and thanks very much for telling us. Um, the march, of course, in London is something that people are uh, talking about quite a lot as well, both the march yesterday and indeed tomorrow, uh, sorry, today I should say, so the, the pro-Palestinian march yesterday, the uh, march against anti-Semitism today starting at half past one. Fiona says, uh, Peter, the lack of actions in the Metropolitan Police is shameful and unacceptable. Are there uh, lack of policing and enforcing the law of the land coming from the Mayor Sadiq Khan? Question mark. We are seeing actions from people in government positions across the UK acting on their personal beliefs, not their constituents. This is bias and breach of position. I just want them to enforce the law and in fairness we have seen mm. some uh, arrests over the past few days. Claire. Do you know, I'm just so sick of all these protests. I really, really am. I don't know what on earth they think they're going to achieve on either side. And it's a, an absolute cost to us. This is the run up to Christmas. London's always been beautiful at Christmas time. Most cities are great at Christmas time. We're trying to get ready for a fantastic feast on the 25th of December that's been completely overshadowed. Would you include the uh, March Against Anti Semitism in that today, or do you think that's well, necessary? I, I don't. Well, 
you know me, I'm not, um, I, I, I'm quite a, a liberal in certain things in that I believe wholeheartedly and truly in freedom of speech and freedom to be able, you know, to be able to articulate how you feel. But I'm just getting so sick of this. And then we've got train strikes coming in as well. Yeah, yeah, what is yeah. happening to the well, discourse the, in this country? Well, the economic uh, problems as well in terms of so many businesses getting, uh, you know, coming up to Christmas is a really, really important yes, time. The, uh, People who don't want to go into, not just London, to go other, into other, other towns and cities as well, well James. Can't. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a general theme there, basically. I mean, I, I that yeah, I mean, I, I I don't have personally a tremendous amount of, a tremendous amount of sympathy or interest, yeah. uh, but you know, obviously, it is their right. It is their right to protest. Quite quite, in, you know, pleased that the, the that the police this time around gave guidance to the protesters about what what was appropriate to do to say and what wasn't appropriate to say because you know, I think. In, and still it was ignored by in, some of them. Yeah, well, of I mean, you've got a mix be. of idiots and racists in, in Well, exactly. In so, and, and it's more brule at this point, James, yeah. as well. It's just shocking. It's horrible. Yeah. Mm. Quite a lot of people getting in touch about immigration, including Jackie, who says we are being gaslit by politicians about immigration, and they do not care about the public's wishes. This is being imposed on us, uh, despite voting to reduce it and making a mockery of democracy. The politicians would do well not to ignore the will of the people. Well, let's talk to Bob, who is in well, London. In uh, Bob has given us a call. What did you say, Claire? Sorry? Oh, nothing. Carry on. <laughs> okay, uh, Bob is in London. 0344 499 1000 is the number he has called. Uh, Bob, what would you like to say? You're very welcome to the programme this morning. Uh, good morning. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, what I'd like to say, I'm looking at the immigration figures, and I remember years ago, <laughs> I'm going back years ago, um, I had a yen for working in the United States. You know, we all loved America and all this stuff. But to get to work in the United States, you had to get a green card. Yeah, I, I worked you in the United get... States myself for for about six months, and there are a lot of a lot of hoops to jump through. Oh, that's right. And then basically, yeah, luckily I worked for an American company, an oil company, but I, I, I still never achieved it. I was offered jobs over there by various people I met in the United States, but I never did it. But why on earth doesn't the UK government have a situation where? If you want to come and live and work in United in the United Kingdom, you have to have a similar to a green card. Well, we were if told we would take back one, control of our borders. Come. We were told there would be an Australian-style uh, points-based immigration system in the 2019 uh, Conservative manifesto as well, Bob. You make some good points there. And um, why why have we failed to control this? Why other feel? I mean, we talk about Rwanda, which I think is is a it's a debate worth having, but actually there's a much wider debate, I think, about illegal and legal migration in this country. The, since 2019, we were told Boris Johnson was going to get it under control. A lot has happened since then, James, but but why is it not under control in your, in your uh, estimation as someone who is well, uh, at the heart of government? Boris Johnson uh, said we would take back control of our borders. We we ended we ended free movement, you know, when we came out of the EU. So you know, we do have a lot more control over over who comes in. What what amazingly pretty Patel as Home Secretary then then imposed was probably a more liberal regime in some ways than we had when we, than we had when when we were in the EU now, you know, and it was one that was more that was tiered to key key uh, areas of the key parts of the economy now and that has resulted in very large numbers of mainly non EU uh, non EU migrants now. Um, that just speaks to, I, I think that speaks to whether it's a failure of government policy is one thing, but it certainly speaks to the need that we see in, uh, that we see in some areas for people to come in. You know, it's significantly mm. driven by health. So clearly we need health people and health workers. And I don't think anyone would dispute that. Uh, it's also a testimony, as we've just discussed, to the, the success of us in marketing one of our key sectors, higher education. Um, and I don't think we should be taking away from that. You know, it's a key driver both both in its own right. But, and but also ha in terms hasn't, of our hasn't the higher education sector been forced into taking so many uh, foreign students because they because need to? Because we're not paying our domestic uh, fees enough. You know, yeah, they're well, cost subsidising. So, uh, so you'd, uh, you'd put up the fees for domestic students, would you? Well. I mean, I would, but I'm not in wow. government, so uh, <laughs> you know. tell, tell that to Scotland because they don't charge. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, in the and socialist paradise that is Scotland. Well, yeah, and, and they don't charge and for head, Euro head, European, they, but they charge for English students. Yeah. Per head, they get a lot more. Uh, per head, they get a lot more funding than, than we do. Cliff in Berkshire says, "Message for Claire. I suspect Brits are not work shy. They likely think that taking a low status care job on the national minimum wage and awful conditions is not worth the hassle. Being skint on benefits is one thing. Being skint having worked sixty hours but only being paid for forty with awful working conditions is another." Says Cliff. What do you make of that? Well, Claire? you know, Cliff, I'm a free.
freelancer and if I don't work, I don't get paid. And, you know, we've all had to survive. I've had to survive having four children on my own. It's very, very tough out there. But I'll tell you, I blooming well did it. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, I went out there and I, I don't care how much you get. It's far better to work, in my view, than it is not to. And I don't care what, and I, I'm not a fa I'm not in favour of minimum wage because I think a lot of people are minimum wage, minimum effort. Mm -hmm. But there's something terribly wrong in this country when we've got a, a swath of people not working who can work um, and who aren't and who are not giving back to society in terms of tax. You, they, you, they will fall into despair. It's not a good model for family life, for home life, not to see people working, to see people working regardless of their job. If they, if you're a cleaner, if you make a coffee, make it the best cup of coffee you can yeah. possibly. If you're a cleaner, clean as well as you possibly can. If you are writing a piece for a newspaper, write it as critically and honestly as you possibly can. Do everything as best as you can and stop thinking you're better than that get up and get on with it we need to bring that back very very good uh, words there from Claire I agree with all of that give us your thoughts on all of this 0344 499 1000 is the number to call uh, you can text as well at 722 with the word talk in your text Stephen Portsmouth has done that he says the problem is that these immigration figures are extra people every year the next year they'll be the same again and contrary to what your guest is saying a lot of students do not go home after their mm -hmm. studies are completed Mick in Wallington says weak in academic inexperienced police leaders I turned central London into Dante's Inferno. Slight exaggeration there, I think. Uh, where public and tourists fear to go Dante's Christmas shopping. Level. <laughs> uh, Khan is in hiding and the Home Office don't care. Stay safe and stay at home, says Mick in Wallington. Dawn in Chelmsford says, Morning, Peter. It is clear that our country needs political leadership that represents the views of the silent majority. The two main parties clearly do not. And uh, Chrissy in North Yorkshire says, Good morning, Peter. I just want to say to the Jewish people that my thoughts are with them on their peaceful march today. I wish I could be with them, but I'm too far away. But I'll be thinking about each and every one of you. Many thanks. Chrissy in North Yorkshire. What a kind message from her. And yes, that march is at half one today. My prediction on arrests? Zero. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, anyway, we're going to continue the debate with Claire and indeed with James Darling after the break. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime, but there's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast ah, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. 
Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? Use? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Well, thanks for, so much for your company this Sunday morning. I have the company in studio of James Dowling, who is a former uh, special advisor and indeed Treasury official. Uh, you were in the Justice Department, of course. Yes, and Ministry of Justice. Ministry of Justice and Claire Muldoon as well. The broadcaster is here with I've, us. I run my own Ministry of Justice. Well, the, yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the, the, the justice made it out by Claire is, is swift and merciless. Um, let's talk about Rwanda because... Um, yeah, interesting one in the Telegraph today. Uh, ministers are apparently completely committed to plans uh, on Rwanda, but the new Home Secretary has said that people should not fixate on this. What do you make of this, James Darling? Well, I agree with it. I think it's a sensible, uh, a sensible exercise in political communication. I mean, regardless of what you think about the policy, we should not be fixating on on Rwanda as as the kind of benchmark for success of of, of our immigration policy. Surely, yeah, that's so what the government has done for some time. It's yes, said this yes. is this is and the thing that's going to solve it all completely, and it's idiotic. And it, it's good that you have a Home Secretary who is now taking a broader approach, uh, rather than saying, rather than taking your most high profile, your most high risk your most divisive policy, which may well fail, uh, and saying if this doesn't succeed, you know, our entire our entire immigration policy but it's is still, broken. But it's still going to be a fact of life between now and the election, especially if they're bringing in emergency legislation this week, for example. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, we may not be fixating on it necessarily. James Cleverley, the new Home Secretary, has also said uh, that uh, leaving the European Convention on Human Rights would jeopardise key cooperation, he thinks, with countries such as France, Albania and Bulgaria, which has helped drive down illegal migration. Do you think he's right, James? Yes, I think he is right. Um, and I also think you know, that leaving the European Convention on Human Rights will create all kinds of other issues in Northern Ireland, for example. Mm. So, I mean, that is not the answer to, a specific, to, to this specific issue. You know, it is taking, it is taking a, a very large sledgehammer and, and smashing, smashing a very small nut. You know, the answer is to do this policy properly and communicate it properly. And so far, the government has failed to do both of those. What do you think of what James has just said there? 0344 499 1000. Anne says there are two causes of Britain's surge in immigration figures, Tony Blair and David Cameron. Uh, Kenny in Edinburgh says, uh, Hi, Cardi P. Uh, Rishi Sunak's decision to sack Zola Braverman wasn't made by a stupid man, but a supremely ignorant one. Politicians are often accused of being out of touch, but never more so than the man currently in number 10. His actions or lack of speak far louder than his words, and this is what people will be thinking about when we go to the polls next year. The vast majority want abuse of the migration system stopped. I hope those in government who advocate open borders really do believe in it because it's going to cost them their jobs. Claire? I think this whole Rwanda thing and the Home Secretary's involved in it, James Cleverly now and Suella Braverman, previously Preeti Patel, I think the Conservative Party themselves are having their own dialogue between the back benches and the front benches. We've got the back they're benches... They're very split. They're, they're very, very, split. very split and they're going they're to internally publicly. combust. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, the back benches are very vocal in you know, saying, well, Cleverly doesn't really have a hold on this. He doesn't really know what he's talking about. Um, this is a, a guy who used to be basically a book salesman, James Cleverly, you know, in publishing. So we just wonder, and uh, indeed we're talking about Verdacher's uh, lexical choice in terms of or the context of his tweet and I would say perhaps going back from what James Cleverley's week has just been mm. he's not too au fait with the English language at times as well in <laughs> describing both people and places is yes, he? Well. You know, so <laughs> all, the all irony places. of ironies, I mean, exact, of all places yeah. um, so I think it, I'm not saying it's a smokescreen, I'm not saying it's not an important part of uh, government legislation and government manifesto and it's very very important to people not only in the red wall um, but all over the country people are actually wanting to know what is happening? What direction yeah. are we heading in? Who can and, we trust to take questions. us here? There are those questions. There is a question about the strategy and the direction and of this And all government. I will say to yeah. the, you know, the people who vote in this country, be careful who you wish for because look what happened. Would you want someone like Wilder? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's becoming totemic of a wider, I yeah. think, of a wider malaise in government. You can't, you know, this is your headline policy for, for for right or ill, and I really do think the kind of the, the turn they took to make it a headline policy was a mistake. But yeah. we are where we are. You know, if you can't deliver this, 
it looks like a shambles. Your immigration policy looks like a shambles. The government looks like yes, a shambles. Yes, it does. And I think On they the need to, you know, I, I think at the point they're at now, it's going to be very difficult to pivot, but they need to start kind of broadening the discussion they have around the wider issue on this with a view, with a view to hoping that if, when this doesn't work, because I think there's a very high risk that one way or another it's not going to work, mm. then, um, you know, it doesn't taint to the extent that it hasn't already the, comp the, the rest of the government's positioning. I would pick up actually on something that you've just said there about France and the whole EHCR thing. We give France an awful lot of money and I don't mm. think there'd been much help at all, to be honest with you. Well, they, they would argue in France's defence words I don't often say, um, <laughs> that they have stopped apparently 50% of people coming across the, so it would be oh. even worse, the small boats. That's what that's what Macron says anyway. Um, just a couple of messages. There have been quite a few of them coming in today. We're going to take some calls a bit later on as well. Dan says, um, Claire, Claire uh, should be Claire Mundoom this morning. No, there's uh, no doom and gloom <laughs> in Mundoom. You know that. It's only protesters the size of a football crowd hardly likely to ruin Christmas. Well, listen, there are a lot of people who they're really... They're vocal, are, though. Yeah, they're vocal, and also people people see it and they may not be there may not be millions of them, but certainly people coming into and towns they might and be cities. Intimidated by yeah, them. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, London's a big place, in fairness. But yes, I think the kind there of the image, the image, uh, the image of, is not. A, is yeah, not a, good a lot of one. Jewish yeah. people who feel safe as well. Yeah. Lucy in Essex says, "Bravo, Claire." There Thank we are. you. Uh, during my working life, I had some reasonably paid jobs as a qualified nurse and later minimum wage jobs. After I left the NHS, I always worked hard and gave good value. However, it was good for my self-respect. Exactly. Good for you, Lucy. Yeah, you do. When you put in put in a, a good shift, you do feel good. Uh, also, Mary in County Down says the hostage reunion footage, you mentioned Leo Varadkar yeah. a minute ago, the hostage reunion footage is important because it gives hope and comfort to the Israeli people, particularly the families of those still waiting for other hostages to be released. It may seem intrusive, but it's necessary. Claire, what do you think of that? Well, that's a good point. I, however, c can't look at it because it's too not... Uh, being a mother, I just don't know how on earth I could deal with that situation. Yeah. And I would not want to be in the mainstream media spectacle in the in through the prism of that I do not want to be anywhere associated with it I think it's a very private moment I think the fact that they have been reunited we can report on that but I personally don't want to see it James what do you think I, I mean I completely agree with, yeah. with everything Claire's just said and I think particularly as a parent you know you can't look at particularly the children without seeing your own your own I, children yeah. there and that's you know it's incredibly difficult so um, but maybe it does give hope as, as Marion County Down says I mean I can see as a journalist that those you know we're talking about it we were talking mm. about those that, that footage we would be talking about those people being reunited anyway but certainly it, it, it does give people hope I think yeah I think well probably or it just reminds you of I mean <laughs> The fact that the, the people are being released give, give, gives you hope. Exactly. Uh, and I, I would hope that Emily Hand has had one picture of her and that is it. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I, I just feel quite discomforted. I mean, they must be feeling very vulnerable. And exactly. coming out and kind of but also being maybe exposed to the what full we don't know. I mean, maybe they're delighted to show the world finally Emily is back and these maybe other they are. are there. Well, maybe so they people. are. Yeah, but it's, it's a bit of a moot point because we don't know. Yeah, yeah. well, that's a, that's a very fair point. Uh, let's talk about another story just briefly because I know this is one you both want to get your teeth into, <laughs> which is the train choo drivers choo. set to strike ahead of Christmas. They can apparently earn salaries of up to a hundred thousand pounds a year. Some claim there is no stress in their job. Um, it's got apparently going to infuriate shoppers and partygoers. It seems to have infuriated you, Claire. Well, it has, because I'm relying on my two children at university at the moment to get home for Christmas. And if they don't, yeah, they will. There are other modes of traffic. They will get a bus. Um, but, I, you know, we need the infrastructure of trains, of rails in this country. I'm fed up with the train you know, strikes. You can't, so you can't plan anything. Of it. So yeah. sick of it. And I was a supporter at the beginning. I thought, OK, you fine, get out there, do what you have to do. Open the discussion because private public partnerships don't really work too well. Um, we, the, and we own the, the national rails themselves, but the franchise, the actual train journeys have been franchised, as we know. Yeah. Uh, Eastern, Western, everywhere. Um, but they just don't seem to add up. And do you remember the day of deregulation when Virgin started to come into it? Everything was great. Yeah. Everything was super. For a while. For a while, right? And then they lost the franchise. Avanti then took the West Coast line. LNER have now got the East Coast. I've got bearing in mind, I've got children in two different sets of uh, universities, and that's why I know. But even just getting up to Glasgow to go up and see my own family, it was great to take the train, four and a half hours, there you go, get on, no security, much easier than it was to fly. But now... You book your train ticket, on, sometimes in hope that you're actually going to make it. Yeah. Come yeah. on, guys. You, 
you just stop it now, will you? Please I know, just we, we, stop. We've, we've had enough. We get the message. James, what do you think? I just think it's absolutely unsupportable and outrageous. They, you know, £100,000 if you want to work that hard is I one mean, of the quotes. £70,000, you know, up to £70,000 seems to be standard for a train driver. You know, a, a level of salary which is beyond what most certainly yes. public sector workers work. Well, the average salary afford. in this country is £34,000. That's more than so, that's so nearly three times. Take the Conservative one. It's, it's, yeah, mm -hmm. so, you know, it's just unbelievable. And for them to for them to say basically, you know, it's uh, Hugh Merriman has said fair and reasonable pay offer is on the table. Hugh Merriman's the rail minister. You know, to, uh, we, we should take train drivers' average salaries from six so average salary from sixty thousand pounds to sixty five thousand pounds. So that's a seven percent increase, which you know, inflation far is, more than is, most people are getting. Exactly, exactly. And you know, Mick Whelan, the uh, the union boss, has 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 the gall to say, you know, train drivers have not had an increase since twenty nineteen. Well, you know. They're Who on, has? as you say, far more than far yes. more than most people to start with. They haven't had an increase actually since 2010. They are one of the few kind of large public service delivery uh, workers that have had consistent above yeah. inflation increases in their pay. Fair, final totally. thought from you. Yeah, no, stop it. Just stop. I mean, we're fed up with just stop oil, but you guys just stop this. Just will stop you, striking. Just They're stop kind of striking. Like that, aren't they? You I know, mean, yes. Just the, the whole anti establishment, anti political. Uh, you know, we've got approach. deliveries. We need to, you know, people, things need to be shipped all across the country. Look what's happened to HS2. We need these lines. We need these trains on. We need to get people home. Are they begun to oppose it? Yeah, it's a very good point. It's a very good point. We need to ask them that, certainly. Uh, folks, thank you both very, thank very much you. indeed. James Darling, former Special Advisor, former Treasury official as well. Didn't even ask you about the uh, autumn statement. Uh, yay or nay? Uh, good, good political effort. Uh, you know, a lot of trouble to come after the election. OK, well, that is, that is a, his, uh, his brief analysis there as we come up to the break. But thank you to James Dowling, uh, former Special Advisor and former Treasury official as well. Thanks also to the wonderful Claire Muldoon, uh, broadcaster. Let's hope the uh, mini Muldoons get home for Christmas, uh, we, we hope. <laughs> and uh, give us your thoughts on anything that the two have said or anything I've said as well, or anything you want to talk about. Perhaps there are things we're not talking about you think we should be talking about. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. You can text me 8722 with the word talk in your text. You can tweet me as well and uh, Jason has done exactly that. He says, I wish your guests would acknowledge the immigration problem is Europe wide, it's not just here. Well, we will be yes. uh, talking about that with Gert, uh, in terms of uh, Gert Wilders as well, the uh, person who has won the election in the Netherlands but may not end up as a Prime Minister. We'll be looking into that in a minute or two with the marvellous Mary Dijewski who's going to bring us up right up to date of about all the uh, international stories as well. Mary is, of course, a uh, foreign affairs columnist with The Independent, so we'll be talking to her in just a minute or two. Well, thank you so much to everybody who has contributed. We'll take more of your calls, texts and tweets after the break. Of course, stay with us here on Talk TV. This is Talk TV. Three, two, one. Uh, go, Graham. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking to the limit. 
If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and Radio. 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here following me around with a cow. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Well, a very good morning. If you've been with me for the last hour, well, that's wonderful. Thank you for your company here on Talk TV. I'm Peter Cardwell. I'm here between now and one o'clock when Johnny Gould takes over between one and four. I want your thoughts on all the issues that we're talking about today. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. You can text me at 7222 with the word talk in your text. That is what Anne has done. She says, I can't believe that Claire... Claire Muldoon, who was just here a few minutes ago, thinks that Gert Wilders is a problem. Uh, he God help us, says Anne. Well, we'll be talking about that in just a few minutes with Mary Dijewski, because he has had a victory in the Netherlands. It certainly spooked a lot of the European establishment. He is a controversial po politician who's uh, linked Muslim immigration with terrorism. He's called for a ban on mosques, called for a ban on the Koran, and he has won the Dutch election. So we're going to be talking about that in a second with Mary Dijewski. We'll also be talking about the village with an army uh, of uh, people catching speeders. Now, the police have given them radar guns. Is this something that you support? Do you think it's good for local uh, would-be uh, have-a-go heroes or are they busy bodies? Let us know your thoughts. 0344 499 1000. None of us likes to be caught speeding. I've been caught speeding a couple of times, it must be said. Uh, John Mayer is a former BBC producer and he will be talking about the, anti, uh, the uh, protest against anti-Semitism later on today. It starts at half past one. Dr Renee is going on it actually, as are some others from this station. Uh, there is fury as BBC journalists have apparently been banned from attending this march to Despite, of course, many colleagues going on the pro-Palestinian march. Is this BBC bias in action? Yet again, let us know your thoughts. As I say, 0344 499 1000. Loads to talk about here on Talk TV. Let's spend the next couple of hours together. Lots on uh, migration as well. Leslie has been in touch to say, Hi, I work with grown men who were only prepared to work 16 hours a week. Their total with benefits was more than my full-time pay. And that is galling to a lot of people, Leslie. I know a lot of people feel very, very annoyed about that. Barry in North Yorkshire says, uh, Hi, Cardi P. I'm 64, lifelong Tory voter. I won't vote for them any longer. I can't see the point of voting now at all. I would never, ever vote Labour. The Tories are a disgrace and have let us all down. And a vote for reform just gives us Labour. The Lib Dems are a waste of space. Why bother turning? out to vote. Well, Barry, I'm so sad that you feel that way because voting is a hard-won freedom for everybody in this country and I really hope you reconsider and find someone to vote for. And do you know what? Even if there's no one you want to vote for, go and spoil your ballot and say and put, put on the ballot that there's no one you want to vote for because at least it'll show that you're participating in the democracy uh, which I think is all of our duty to do so. Uh, not voting of course is a right as well and we live in a free society uh, there are places like Australia where you get fined if you don't vote. It's mandatory to vote there. I don't think we should bring that in here but we should be encouraging people to vote and um, if you don't vote I'm afraid uh, it's, it's hard to take people seriously when they complain because you do have an opportunity to be part of the change that many people feel this country 
Free Needs. I live in a constituency in London where it doesn't really matter how I vote because the person who is the MP is going to uh, continue being the MP there because they have a rock solid seat. Uh, but and that can be frustrating to some people. Maybe there should be a reform of the voting system. Let us know what you think about that as well. Also on Clare and Muldoon, um, I also think, uh, says uh, Ian in Glasgow, that there will be no arrests at the uh, protest against anti-Semitism. And I bet you it turns out that way there will be no way the BBC will report it, says Ian in Glasgow. Great show. Claire Talking Sense, she is a top lass, uh, says uh, Ian. Uh, well, I'm sure, uh, well, listen, we'll see what the BBC report on, on if they don't report it. But uh, certainly we're talking about them a bit later on about whether their employees can actually go on the march. Sandra, uh, final one before we get to Mary Dajewski. Sandra has been in touch as well. It says legal immigration is not easy and is certainly not free. It is very expensive. I am here on an ancestral work visa. My great grandfather died for this country. My grandfather was born here. His mother was encouraged as a war widow to emigrate to the Commonwealth of South Africa. There are plenty of well paying jobs in the UK for those that want to work, and all immigrant workers are contributing national insurance and tax. So you, some UK citizens can sit at home and moan about immigrants, says Sandra. Uh, very interesting one. Uh, final one, sorry. Anne says Peter, re regarding real strikes, never mind just stop it. What about stopping massive profits going to the foreign-owned rail companies and their shareholders? Lots to talk about, lots of opinions, and uh, certainly let us know yours, 0344 499 1000. Right, I want to talk about Gert Wilders in uh, the Netherlands. He has won the um, he has won the election there, and Mary Dijewski is foreign affairs columnist with The Independent. Mary, great to have you on the programme again. How are you doing? Fine. Pleasure to be with you again. What do you make of Gert Wilders' um, victory? But it doesn't look as if he's going to end up being the Prime Minister of the Netherlands. What's going on there? Well, this quite often happens across Europe. Um, when the far right do rather well in elections, then um, other parties rather gang up against them um, and do their utmost to keep them out of power. Um, and it has to be said, you know, it's very easy to say Gerd Wilders won the election. Um, but the vote in the Netherlands, because, partly because of their system, partly because of the uh, of the huge number of parties there, um, was very, very fragmented. And although, you know, it's a very easy headline to say the far right Gert Wilders, veteran politician, won the election. What he won was actually 25 percent of the seats in the Dutch parliament. Now, that's more than any other party, but it's very, very far from being a majority of Dutch opinion. It has certainly sent shockwaves across Europe, though. There are many in the EU who are worried about this, Mary. Tell us about that. Yes, absolutely, because um, some people look across Europe and they see, as it were, a great tide of the far right sweeping across, largely in response to the scale of migration from outside the EU, both legal and illegal. Um, the I find it um, maybe that the panic, at least at the moment, is um, a bit exaggerated because it doesn't look quite like that to me. Yes, there was a vote in um, Slovakia where the, I mean, the the far right. I mean, it's not quite the far right. All these parties are rather uh, are rather different, and they have shadings. Um, but the, do, you, do you think the, we the, use the, that? I, I wonder, actually, Mary. Sorry, this is slightly off topic. But do you think mm -hmm. we use that free as far right too easily in a lot of these descriptions of things? Because I I, I keep hearing it, and in, in in relation to so many aspects. For example, the. Um, the riots in Dublin a few days ago and say, oh, these are far-right protesters. Well, 70, I'm, not, I'm absolutely not condoning that violence at all for a second. Violence is not justified. There are 75% of people in Ireland, according to one poll, that say that they, there's too much immigration in Ireland. 83% of supporters of Sinn Féin, which is certainly not a far-right party, uh, say that they are anti-immigration or that there is too much immigration. So I wonder if, we, if we're too quick to call people far right when they criticise things like immigration. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's, it, yes, you know, in a way you need a simple label yeah. and it's very difficult to write news stories without having simple labels. Um, but when you look at the fast gamut of um, political, um, political, of the political complexion that the far right currently covers, it conjures up in people's minds, basically going back to Nazis in Germany. 
and yet what you're looking at today is it is that's as it were the the, the 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 scare story and it's not without foundation but when you look across europe you people look at hungary and say that um victor orban is labeled far right he's not really far right he's more of a nationalist hungary first type of politician um the same with what was described as the far right um when they topped the polls in slovakia um a couple of months ago and then but then we had the reverse effect um in poland when it was quite expected that the the, the, the former polish uh, polish government was going was going to win and they were regarded as nationalist and not quite far right but almost far right um they lost the polls and you know, the, were, are, are we looking there at um a trend as it were for people to vote against the incumbent government of whatever complexion and you can see that maybe in in the netherlands and in slovakia where they were voting against the status quo because a lot of people seem to have been very dissatisfied in particular on the question of migration um are they voting primarily against the incumbent and hoping for somebody more effective mm. or are they actually voting for um in broad terms a far-right party but in poland um it was donald tusk's party very pro-european um centrist um liberal with a small l in it in its disposition and poland is a much much bigger country mm. than either slovakia or the netherlands i think the netherlands vote in a way had a particular impact um in the uk um because first of all it's so close but also because the that what we have seen as a trend towards you know quote far right voting we've generally associated with the central and eastern part of europe looking at west of europe yes you see that you you see the um the strength of marine le pen in france you see um possibly the rising influence of the alternative for deutschland the um regarded as the far right party there um but are they capable of winning elections mm. that's not at all clear i want to talk about another uh, foreign affairs issue because uh, the U us and germany are apparently pushing for a truce in the russia ukraine war we've talked about this a lot uh, previously mary and kiev has been hit by the biggest drone attack since the war began in recent days just give us the latest on that in terms of what's happening well this is a very very interesting story about the um the americans and uh, and, and um germany because there's been a spate of really quite high level visitors to kiev in the last week or so and they have included the head of the cia they've included the american defense secretary and they've included the german defense secretary and of course all these people have uh, have gone to kiev they've had, they've had talks with zelensky they've talked to their opposite numbers in kiev and the public readout from all these visits has been yes um strong western support is continuing there's going to be no backsliding on um on military and other support for ukraine against russia but it seems that um behind the scenes it's been a rather different story there've also been reports that the us and some european countries which have been um the most generous in supplying ukraine with weapons are actually running out of their own stocks and can't actually physically can't supply the amount of um weapons and ammunition that kiev is asking for and if that is so then that will hamper kiev's war effort there are also signs of um obviously there there are political questions in the us because next year's um election campaign is hotting up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um it's observed that opinion in america has either um lost interest in the ukraine war if it ever had 
yeah. a high degree of interest, um, but is also um, concerned about the continuing cost, both the both the financial cost to the U.S., um, but also the to an extent the, the 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 human cost in Ukraine, which is something that you know I'm very preoccupied as well, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it seems to me that the more weapons that we feed into Ukraine, um, the more we are actually prolonging the war, yeah. and the more Ukrainians are going to die. I totally agree, Mary. And there, and, there, and there has to be a way to solve it. There has to be a way to, to get, get an end to this. Mary Dijewski, thank you very, very much indeed. That's she's a foreign affairs columnist with The Independent. Speaking a lot of sense there, as always, especially on Ukraine there. Um, thank you to everybody who's been in touch, especially in this debate about what is far right and what isn't. And I think it's just, it's, it's sort of, uh, sometimes it's justified, of course it is. Sometimes it is a, a lazy phrase. Uh, Dan from Kent says, having the desire to control migration is a right-wing policy. It's not far right nationalism, it's common sense. But being manipulated by the left. Mick says political commentators always say far right when they do well in elections, but never far left when they do well is a political ma manipulation by the elite. Yeah, well, are, I mean, how many people call Jeremy Corbyn far left? I know I certainly did, but um, I mean, he, he is um, far left. There's no doubt about that. Um, Amanda in London says Peter on non-voters. It saddens me greatly to hear some people saying that they will not be voting. It is vital to make your views known in these troubled times. And she is advocating voting for uh, reform. She says the Labour majority will be a thorn in their sides. If you want to change this country, there has to be a tidal wave of votes to reform, which will uh, no doubt reduce the Labour majority. Um, that is an interesting one. And actually, on voting, um, Gary in Paisley in Scotland has given me a call 0344 499 1000. Gary, you're very welcome to the programme. What would you like to say this morning? Uh, I, would, uh, I was listening to what you were saying, Peter, uh, about voting, about going and even spoiling your vote. Yeah. But the minute you put an X, on that ballot paper. Under British law, an X denotes that you are incompetent. Check any Black's Dictionary and you'll find out that it, it denotes you as incompetent. Did you know that you and don't have to put an X, Gary? Sorry? Did you know that you don't actually have to put an X, you just have to put a symbol of any, any way that shows a preference, expressing a preference? Most people do it with an X, but you don't have to. Well, they do tell you to put an X. Yeah, yeah, I know they do. But, but if you put a tick, you, it's the same thing. Still be counted. But Peter, why would you why would you put anything other than your signature? When you put your signature, then at least it can be verified. But it's, it's supposed to, I mean, it's supposed to be a secret ballot, Gary. You're not meant to meant to know who's voting for who. Peter, why do they call it a ward? I, I don't you know. You tell words. me. You find wards in hospitals. Yeah. So they have his done as incompetence, mental incompetence. <laughs> right. We're all mental incompetence. You're, you're, you're not happy with the politicians up there in Scotland anyway, Gary? No, this is a system. It's, it's a sham system. They're even laughing at it. They call it, you know, uh, you know, calling it wards. So do, 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 do you vote, Gary? Do you vote at all? Uh, it's a waste of time. There's okay. none of them. Are, there's none of them trustworthy. Do you know what happens, Peter, in the, in the political system? See, you normally start off as a as a counsellor, and I'm I'm seeing you're talking in the TV, but I'm, I I don't know. I was getting confused here. You're talking away to somebody else in the TV or me. No, no, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Gary. We're listening. What, what was I saying there? You were saying uh, that you start off as a counsellor if you're elected. Aye, most people start off as a counsellor in the political system, and and I've stood for a. a MP Westminster and I've stood in local politics. Oh, you've, you've stood well. yourself? I have stood myself. Okay. The experience was unbelievable. In, in, a, in a good ways. way or a bad way, Gary? Uh, in good and bad ways. Okay. But the the minute that some someone is elected, generally a councillor, the first thing that they're called on to do is to do the paperwork. Mm-hmm. So you have to sign your data protection forms and stuff yep. like that and sign your expenses. There's all list of expenses. And there's generally something on expenses that you won't take. Well, I, well, I don't have a car. I just get public transport. And it's, okay. you'll have somebody, you're, you'll have your Alistair Campbell type standing in the background giving it. Look, if you don't sign that, you're trying to make everyone else look bad. So they get me sign some expenses, claim form. And at that point there, they've got them. You, you think you think they're brought into the system and that's it? The, the, the second that you're brought in as a councillor, Peter, 
they will have something on you and they'll make it very, very clear that they've got something on you. This is how politics works. Well, I, I, so I, think, I think there's some good people in politics as well, Gary. But listen, thanks for your, thanks for your thoughts. Uh, Jennifer is in London. Jennifer, what would you like to tell us this morning? Um, well, I'd like to pose a question, actually. I'm rather intrigued as to why um, all the students that come from, well, not all of them, but a majority or a lot of them who come mm -hmm. from abroad want to bring all their families here. And we naively let them. Because if the student is only coming for a couple of years, why would the family want to uproot itself, perhaps leave a job, to come here? And where do they stay? And who pays for them? Yeah, well, I, I, surely, I mean, some people might say it's reasonable, Jennifer, to say, look, if you're married, to bring your, to bring your husband or wife with you. More. Well, I, I, I don't look at many students as mature and married. I look at students as uh, young people. But, but some of them um, are, Jennifer. Yeah, some of them might be, but probably not in the numbers that we're talking about. OK, OK. And um, also, most students want to get away from their families for a couple of years to sort of spread their, their wings, as you might say. I certainly so, did um, when I went to university. So, uh, yeah, so I don't think that these people have any intention of ever going back to their own country, and it's an easy way to get into our country. And the other thing is, when we have the people coming on the boats, not all of them, very few of them, I would suggest, are perhaps coming from war-torn countries. And so they've left families and they've left homes, so effectively they're making themselves homeless. Mm. So why are we then giving them homes? Because... Where I live, from, um, well, all around me and into London, for many, 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 many years they've been building and are still building enormous, high-rise, ugly, um, blot-on-the-landscape buildings, flats. And we've said for years, well, who are all these uh, properties for? Mm. Well, I think now we know. Okay. And do we really want our country to be concreted over? I think a lot of people feel feel the same way, but there is a housing crisis in this country, uh, even for for people who are are not immigrants here, Jennifer. That's yeah, that's certainly a problem. People aren't getting accommodated. Yeah. The, the, the 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 people coming from abroad get priority over them. That is why we've got people put in hotels where other people are living in um, uh, not very nice hotel yeah. accommodation. You know, in bed and breakfast. And a, a lot of a lot of other families. I, I I totally take your point, Jennifer. I think a lot of people find that very very galling. And very upsetting actually so thank you for it dan says i think uh, caller gary needs to hop to russia for a while to appreciate how important the vote is uh, tad davison in cambridge says morning peter two very brief points who give any of our political parties the mandate to substantially increase the population especially with those who do not reflect our values on speeding the local highways department have recently installed speed bumps in a 20 mile an hour zone and my jaguar hates them oh tad my heart bleeds for you um uh, 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 your poor jaguar the slightest touch and she's over the speed limit worse buses delivery drivers and motorcycles ignore them completely at uh, regards todd davison in cambridge and uh, jaguar driver there i i honestly i, I think we can we have a moment's silence for Tad and his and his Jaguar. I'm only joking, Tad. Listen, if you drive a Jaguar, good luck to you. Um, I'm, I'm horribly jealous. It's a beautiful car, no matter what model you're in. I'm not a big uh, car person, but I do love them. Um, uh, Yapman has been in touch to say, Good morning, Peter. I consider every job, no matter what you do, is important. If you're getting paid for it, someone must value it. Try not emptying the bins and cleaning public loos for a week. See how we get on. Uh, absolutely agree with that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I just... I, I just, I totally agree with you. And there are so many jobs that we see as low status, and they're absolutely not low status. Caring, for example, there were wonderful uh, carers who cared for my grandmother before she died, and um, they were they were great, great people who didn't get paid a heck of a lot of money. It must be said. And I think we we're too snooty about certain jobs, and we value things. You know, um, people who go to university, for example, we all say, "Oh, isn't that wonderful?" You know, you're off to university. Yes, it is. But should you be? Um, and there's so many other jobs that you can do and earn a lot more money. Actually, um, I always go on about the plumber who came into my house, spent seven minutes, and uh, got ninety two pound bill at the end of it so i'm totally over that i've moved on that's the main thing actually on the note of uh tad's jaguar and the uh, the village army catching speeders with police radar guns we will be talking to howard cox the founder of fairfield uk next on that exact issue Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? 
we do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Well, thank you so much to everybody who is watching and listening today. I want your thoughts on all of the issues we're talking about, 0344 499 1000. And thanks to Tech Up Dave, who just brought me in a chocolate finger, which is very nice. He said he had no problem giving me the fingers. Um, thank you to everybody who's texted in. Uh, Peter, we don't have a secret ballot in the UK. The electoral officials routinely write your voter ID number on your ballot paper. They say it is to avoid voting fraud, which may be partly true, but we do not have a secret ballot, uh, says this person. Uh, Mark says, since we're not allowed a none of the above box on the ballot, how about a box or two to indicate the voters' preference on whether this election should be under proportional representation or first past the post? That way we would feel as though a vote for non-mainstream parties may not be a wasted vote. Well... By a remarkable coincidence, we have a candidate in the London mayoral election with us. That is Howard Cox, who is founder of Fair Fuel UK and the Reform UK uh, candidate for the mayor of London. Hello. Morning, Peter. Uh, and also, thank you for the finger from your producer. That's well. right. Well, he's, he's very happy to give you the fingers. Um, so um, <laughs> yes, he's, he's laughing there as I'll talk, <laughs> talk up Dave. And we're going to talk about a village army catching speeders. But first yeah. of all, maybe I could ask you about this. There are people this morning, we're having a bit of a debate about whether it's worth voting, whether it's worth... I mean, some people may say, look, Reform UK doing reasonably well in the polls, sort of 8 or 9% in some of the polls, but realistically, you're probably not going to win against Sadiq Khan, let's say, if Jeremy Corbyn styles and the Mayor of London and so on. But, uh, I mean, what would you say to those people who say it's just not worth voting well I, I take great uh, objection to you so i'm probably not going to win because i when i win okay uh, i i'm very confident this uh, my, our private polling says i'm moving up very fast etc mm -hmm. and depending on people like whether jeremy corbyn actually enters the race etc which could split khan's vote as well yeah it could change things the, all those sorts of things it could be, there's about 19 cont contenders in this thing but I, I say to people i voted troy for 50 years 
and I'm not and I've moved to Reform UK simply because the Tory party is no longer Tory it's just Tory in name only and that's the reason why I've moved to Reform UK and to cut a long story short forget about the colours of the politics in this involved with this just look at the issues and when I talk about issues when I present right across London at the moment in talking I say do you agree with this one do you agree with this one they all agree whatever mm. spectrum of politics they are so all I'm saying is vote on the issues don't vote tactically vote on the issues and don't vote who you think you should vote for yeah. tell me about your thoughts on Sadiq Khan and uh, his, as you have put it, um, two colleagues of yours sitting there protesting in front of vans. This is about ULEZ and so on. You're saying mass thugs were used to protect ULEZ enforcement vans. Tell us about this. Well, as you know, this this most undemocratic uh, introduction of a, a policy to actually flee strivers, ULEZ, in London. What we've seen here at the moment in time is that we, uh, people are so frustrated with this. In a public consultation agreement, two out of three didn't want it. And I'm afraid the frustration has come out on the streets with, well, you've heard of them, called Blade runners yes. they're going around and i don't condone this whatsoever of course they're, not. they're ripping course. down cameras and things like that but now because of those cameras are being ripped down they've got portable camera vans which has been introduced by tfl but they're also being they're peacefully protested with people standing with giant dinosaurs with their heads blocking the cameras and things like that and all done in good uh, uh, fun etc but recently it's turned a bit, bit of a corner because he's employed uh, uh, security firms who do not have their SIA certificates which they need to have their security industry association they need to be identified recognizable some of them are in balaclavas or masked etc and they've been re resorted to thuggish behavior and one person which is a person called Heather Watt in Biggin Hill was peacefully demonstrating and one of the security guys drove the car into her and, and knocked her over and she's severely injured. Goodness she, me. Yes, it, it's disgusting and, and okay, it's in with the police at the moment, etc. But I'm afraid it, I'm hearing about this right across London, Peter. Mm. It's not just in Biggin Hill. Goodness me, goodness me, that is that is very worrying. And of course, peaceful protest should be allowed, exactly. but vigilante as action, absolutely not. We can't condone that. Um, lots and lots of people uh, getting in touch on this exact issue, actually, including this person who says, just a warning for this town that are being given the speed cameras. We're going to talk about that in a second. We have the same thing in our town, but whatever you do, don't wave at them. And when you go past under the speed limit, yes. I did and got a visit from the local plot. <laughs> goodness me. Um, so this is the story about uh, uh, volunteers backed by local police. They're taken to the streets to tackle problem driving. Uh, some motorists have accused them of vigilantism and spying. 29 motorists will are going to receive warning letters from police reprimanding them for exceeding the speed limit in the cramped streets of a Cornish village. Um, so people are being accused of breaking the law, uh, one car doing 36 miles an hour, uh, 20 mile an hour limit. I mean, are these just busybodies or are they responsible citizens holding these uh, speed cameras uh, hard? I, I think they're good intentioned people and good for them for trying to do this, but I'm afraid it's an excuse. We haven't got enough traffic officers and they're doing the job of the police. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing is, I'm, I feel a bit uncomfortable about using people like that. And I'm not blaming the individuals involved. And I, in my village where I live in Kent, that we see them quite a lot. Just past the little speeding sign which comes up, you're driving below 30 or whatever, yeah. or that yeah. sort of thing. And if you're past them, they're standing there with their clipboard and their tabards on. They're very nice. And they're nice people. They don't mean it. Most of them are retired, mm -hmm. etc. The simple thing is, I think the police are using them. And unfortunately, yeah. you know, they have no clout. They, they don't carry anything weight in terms of actually prosecutions in terms of this so what's the point why not just have more traffic officers on this or you can have the automatic ones i've exactly. often had you give us a smiley face if you're under the yeah, exactly. speed limit and not that i would ever obviously have exceeded no, you've never the seen speed one speed limit. Limit. no no never, never seen that yeah um it's uh, it's very interesting actually tad has been in touch about his jaguar as well he says i wish there was a way to send you a photograph by text my three liter jag diesel does a shade under 60 miles a gallon at motorway speeds and it's just about the cheapest most fuel efficient car i've ever owned not to mention the most comfortable, which is a prerequisite for my severely disabled wife. Regards, Tad Davison. Yeah. Well, Tad, Tad um, you, I think you're probably the first person to advocate having a Jaguar to save money, uh, but I wish <laughs> you all the very best with it, and I am uh, of course just horribly jealous, and I wish you well, and listen, uh, we, uh, your wife and you are clearly, uh, wife in particular, are clearly having quite a few struggles there with her being severely disabled, and if that helps her get out and about and live a good life, well, that's fantastic. And listen, I, I know I was sort of joking earlier on, Tad, but I wish you all the very best with that, and listen, you drive along. As long as you've got uh, talk on the radio, that's the main thing. Um, another big thing that's happening in London today, Howard, and actually you're heading there uh, just shortly after this, is, of course, the um, the um, 
protest against anti-Semitism, and we've had many, many pro-Palestinian marches. This is sort of from the other side. Maybe there'll be some people who go to both. I would doubt it. But you're going on that march. Just tell us a little bit about your reasons for doing so. It's very, very simple. I, I, as I'm standing for London Mayor, and I'm fed up with this division that's happened in London, and I've been approached... Uh, by email, by phone, by text, by WhatsApp, by the Jewish community who are scared stiff to go out of their front door at the moment and they're being vilified, demonised, etc. And I want to show my support, though they are part of the UK, they're part of the, uh, uh, the, the, the community we, we so cherish in London. And what I, I, I'm not anti-Palestinian, I'm anti-Hamas, but I'm very pro-Palestinian, but I want to show my support for, you know, as potentially London Mayor next year for the Jewish community. OK, well, um, listen, we should wish you well for that. I know Dr Renee is going on that one as well. Um, Colin is in Thurrock in Essex. He's giving me a call on 03444991000. Colin, um, thank you for your call. What would you like to say to Howard and to me? When I Google Ule's charge on my phone, it says £15 if I pay the day before I go there, £12.50 on the day, and £17.50 up to midnight on the third day after that it's a penalty charge but nobody's ever mentioned this Howard, it is confusing for people, isn't it? it? It is indeed. In fact, I was up in... I drove into London yesterday and I forgot to do my congestion charge yesterday, so I had to pay the extra £2.50, the 1750 uh, situation. We are all being fleeced, and uh, all you've got to do if you live in London, vote for me because it's all going. You, <laughs> right. is going can, can you actually get it all going on day one, though? I mean, surely Yeah, I, well, I'll just shut it down, because if, if we can't shut it down, all the charges have to be zero pounds. OK, all right, well, there's your answer, Colin. Um, that's, uh, I think a lot of people do find it uh, very confusing. Thank you very very, very much indeed for that. Um, I wonder, actually, if I could ask you about something else, another debate we're having this morning. Sorry, I'm just throwing this at you, that's Howard. I haven't, right. haven't kind of, uh, haven't kind of briefed you beforehand. But we're having a debate about the, the, the phrase far right. Yeah. So we've had Gert Wilders, who is in um, who is in the Netherlands. He has called for for some some very strong things that a lot some people may agree with, some people may disagree with. He wants to ban the Quran, for example. I wouldn't do that. He wants to ban. Uh, he would. He wants to ban um, uh, Muslim places of worship. He, I wouldn't do that either. Um, and he wants to put curbs on immigration, which I think is quite a sensible idea. He, of course, has been under twenty uh, four hour protection. He's been banned from the UK in two thousand nine. Are, are you happy with him being called far right? And what do you think far right actually means? Because I, I think it's too easy. And personally, I think not necessarily in regard to Gert Wilders, but certainly in general, I think it's a phrase that people bandy about too much. Well, you're looking at a guy who, on the eve of seventy years of age who's voted Tory all his life. I'm a middle of the road Tory. I'm a one nation Tory. That sort of person. Low taxation, small state. Um, but because I've moved to Reform UK, to actually d instil those particular uh, uh, edicts and, and, and sort of what I believe in, I'm sometimes accused of being far right now. And that's the sort of thing. I don't know what far right is. We never hear far left. Mm. And those are the sorts of things. I'm fed up with this spectrum of where you're positioned in politics. Can I repeat what I said just now? Look at the issues. And as far as he's concerned, I wouldn't ban the crown. I'm with you on the peak. I, I want free speech. I want allowed to go. But let's make it peaceful and let's have a debate that's not divisive. Thank you very much indeed for that, Howard. Uh, Sally has been in touch. She says, I was so glad to hear you challenge the use of the phrase far right. It seems to me that anywhere there is trouble not associated with the left, it is immediately labelled far right. My family in Dublin says some people living in North Dublin are very deprived and just fed up with having very little while incomers appear to get everything free. As always, Peter, you and your show are fabulous. Thank you, Sally. And sorry, I really appreciate that. And that is an interesting one in Dublin because we have, um, there, a lot of people said, well, these are far right protesters. Well, actually, if you look at the statistics, I said this earlier on the programme, um, something like 75% uh, of people in Ireland think there is too much immigration to or too much migration to Ireland, and the 83% uh, of Sinn Féin voters, who are a big party there, could well be part of or perhaps solely the next government in Ireland. Are 83% uh, of their supporters say there is too much immigration? Are they far right? Well, um, they wouldn't call themselves far right. So it is. We ju just need to be careful with those kind of phrases. Um, and uh, Matthew says, whilst painting Gert Wilders as far right, it's also important to inform your listeners. He's been forced to live under 24-hour security after relentless death threats from followers of the alleged religion of peace, says Matthew. Uh, well, I would argue that the people who are... Uh, I know this isn't going to be popular with few, uh, some viewers and listeners, but I would argue that the people who are threatening Gert Fielders, and he shouldn't be threatened, they should have, uh, he should be able to live a free life and so on, I would argue that they're not proper Muslims because proper Muslims do believe in peace. Um, and those who uh, yeah. subvert it, uh, those who uh, are uh, Muslims who support uh, Wahhabism, for example, 
example, who, who support, uh, who support um, the death cults of, of uh, terrorist organisations like Hamas, for example, that is not proper Islam. I'm sure there are people who will disagree with me on that. Let me know what you think. Um, Dan says, politically, I'm absolutely behind Howard Cox, but personally, my timber truck is too old for London, so it's been great being more local. There are people who are changing their habits because of you, Les, aren't there, Howard? Absolutely right. And it, it, in, in that respect, the threat of what's happening with you, Les, is maybe is a good thing. But it shouldn't be done on the basis of hitting people in the pocket. And that's the sort of thing. It's small businesses, sole traders. The whole thing is a mess. And what we sh and it's it's also done on a prefix on basis on wrong data. I mean, you know, false f health fatality data. And and we're, we're seeing, you know, we saw last week at the, the ASA, the Advertising Standards Authority, reporting the fact that the, the, the mayor actually uh, presented various data uh, to say that the NOx was being reduced in an advert. And mm. it wasn't. It was didn't happen that way. There's too many lies flying around at the moment in time regarding this. We need to work together. Let's get this London motoring again. Howard, thank you very much. I hope the uh, hope the um, per, the march goes uh, very peacefully and very uh, satisfactorily later on. It's good that you're joining, and I can't unfortunately, but I know yeah. that you're going. And Dr. Renee is as well, and a few other people as well from the spilling. Thanks for coming in as yeah. well as Howard Cox there, who is the founder of Fair Fuel UK, is also the London mayoral candidate for Reform UK. We're going to talk a bit more about that march in just a second, actually, and whether BBC employees are actually allowed to go on it. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that in a second with a former BBC producer. Stay with us here on Talk TV. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. <laughs> Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> yeah. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Very good to speak to Howard Cox there, and I'm always uh, quite careful how I pronounce his name because we uh, got texts one time before when, um, in my Northern Irish accent, I pronounced Howard as Hard, which, with the surname, 
often doesn't work particularly well. I'll let you do the uh, maths on that one. Uh, Brenna in Cheshire has been in touch. She said, I voted Conservative since the Thatcher years. I can't vote for the, them again, but I certainly won't vote Labour either. I believe we should vote. Uh, so Reform Party, here I come, says Brenda, clearly convinced by what Howard is saying there. Bob says, Peter and Mr Cox and the other female candidate will split the vote and can will win. They need to combine now. I'm not quite sure who Bob is referring to. Certainly we interviewed another candidate uh, previously a couple of weeks ago um, and uh, 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 her name, uh, sorry, remind me her name, Chris? Natalie Campbell, Natalie Campbell, that's right. Yes, yeah, she was very good, very interesting woman. Um, but of course, it'll be interesting to see if Jeremy Corbyn enters the race, perhaps as an independent candidate, because I think that could split Sadiq Khan's vote, actually. And then maybe Susan Hall, who's the... Uh, Con uh, Conservative candidate might come through the middle. It'll be a fascinating election, not just for London, but of course right across the country as well. And will we have a general election on the same day, on the 4th of May? Uh, certainly the uh, moves with national insurance, I think, this week were perhaps allowing for a spring or May election there. Big question for Rishi Sunak, whether his troops will come out on the 4th of May and then again perhaps in October, November in the wind and the rain to um, get the vote out. Very, very interesting political times we live in, to say nothing of the American election coming uh, later into 2024 as well. George has been in touch. He says, Peter, yes, far right as a term is used much too often. To me, it describes fascist and hardline views regarding racial and colour prejudice. Unfortunately, it's used to describe those whose views are that immigration should be controlled in order to maintain unity in their country by preventing their culture being radically challenged, says George. Good that we're having this debate, and there's so few times when people actually have these debates, not just on immigration, but on these kind of phrases and so on. Uh, Phil is in Cardiff and says, Morning, Peter, watching your programme now. You said that it's a democratic vote, but in reality it's not. They give a voting paper with a number written on the back of your voting slip to which is written next to your address. So if they want, they know exactly who you're voting for, uh, says Phil. Who has really got to go through all those? I actually find the way things happen or have happened until recently in England really weird in that I can just walk in and say, my name's Joe Bloggs and uh, give me my ballot paper. And voter ID is something I absolutely agree with. A lot of people don't. Um, uh, on the march now, we're going to be talking about this uh, protest against anti-Semitism. And uh, Mary in County Down has been in touch to say that she's quite annoyed that it's being styled as a Jewish event. It's actually far more important, and it's really, really important, she says, that non-Jews attend and show their solidarity. Well, some uh, both Jewish and non-Jewish people who might want to attend uh, work for the BBC, but they have been told apparently that they should not go. Now, this is interesting because uh, many colleagues uh, have apparently gone on pro-Palestine rallies. Let's talk to John Mayer now, who is a former BBC producer. John, uh, we're getting sort of some conflicting reports over this, but it is interesting in that uh, the BBC has been engulfed in yet another anti-Semitism row. There's been so many of these, certainly in regard to some of the reporting of what's going on, the reporting of some of the protests, and also the reporting of the Israel-Hamas uh, conflict. BBC journalists were apparently uh, banned by senior managers from attending today's march. What do you make of this, John? Peter, this is somewhere you know very well. This is the Oxford Examination School, where I was selling a book today. But, look, this is a non-story. It really is a non-story. BBC banned staff from going to Palestinian demonstrations. BBC banned staff from going to, to anti-Semitism demonstrations. What's the difference? Who, who's confected this, you know? Who are these producers? Why, are, why aren't they coming out into the open? Why, why are they being anonymous? I mean, a month ago, the story about a, a BBC journalist from Radio Derby who, who w was resigning. He turned out to be a man who phoned in the scores on Saturday. Look, you know, the BBC has to maintain... He, he was, I'm sorry, he was a BBC journalist. He had he commentated on games. He was booked for further shifts and he was a BBC yeah. journalist and he resigned. So that was a legitimate story. And with this All one... Right, he was a very minor player, Peter. You know, he, he, so he doesn't he, matter. He, 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 he was he was not he was not Richard Dimple. He was a minor player. So, he, so he doesn't he doesn't matter then if he's a minor player who objects to uh, the BBC not calling Hamas terrorists. Well, you know, look, you know, the the, 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 the right wing press enjoys confected stories about the BBC. I looked at some. How do you know Telegraph it's confected? Today. What's that, Peter? How do you know it's confected, John? Well, look at the Sunday Telegraph today. There are three stories about the BBC, all anti-BBC. They've, they've got they've got an, an agenda, a rather nasty agenda. They're, they're like hyenas. They 
little circle of BBC looking for little bits of meat and then go and grab it. You know, so are you saying the, the Sunday BBC Telegraph look. is wrong simply because it has uh, stories that are not convenient for the BBC? No, I'm, I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying they spend their life looking at anti-BBC stories, and this is one. Should the you BBC know, not the BBC. be scrutinised? We're paying, we all pay something like 150 quid a year to our licence fee. Surely it's a you big public know. institution. But look at what you get for that, Peter. You, you know, you used to work for it. You know, you, I did. You, you get all those TV channels, all the radio, everything else. You, you get bloody good value for money. The licence fee may have to change. That, and maybe we can defend that to the death. But, you know, you get a universal service for lots of people. I mean, you know, I just wish the right-wing press would stop uh, circling the BBC, looking looking for meat. Forget it. You know, go go and look for stories. Uh, well, I mean, there, there may well be stories about one of our uh, biggest uh, public institutions, especially if there are staff here who aren't coming out. And as you correctly say, John, they're not coming out, coming out publicly because they presumably fear for their jobs if they report the fact that they're being told not to go on a, uh, an, uh, on a march against anti-Semitism. As, as indeed were, 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 Palestinian, were Arab staff told not to go on a pro-Palestinian demonstration. So, so what's the story? There's the story, though. Is there really? Okay, John, listen, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts on that. We're not going to agree on it, but I appreciate uh, you coming on and telling us your thoughts on it. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, Tanya has been in touch just in regard to this. Um, thanks for highlighting uh, my um, colleague. She is a colleague, Catherine Fo Foster. I cover politics, she covers politics, GB uh, News uh, political correspondent who was harassed um, and uh, someone else is talking about other uh, journalists at GB News who have been uh, harassed and accused of doing all sorts of horrendous things and certainly, uh, I mean, we have here too and I can honestly say I did one interview, I think it was two weeks ago, uh, the, yes it was two weeks ago, it was the 11th of uh, Round uh, Remembrance Weekend and there was one particular interview I did and listen, I'm not saying woe is me and I, uh, my life is terrible. Many, many people and many broadcasters, to say nothing of members of the public, have been through far, far worse things but uh, there was one particularly fractious interview I did and I got an absolute torrent of hatred, uh, mostly on Instagram actually, and uh, ended up having making my, my profile um, private, which I, I don't want to do. I want people to contact me. There are people who send me direct messages, for example. There are lovely people who send me direct messages on Twitter, uh, and there are not-so-nice people as well. And I want to be accessible. I want to be able to, to answer people and to have chats with them rather than being in a kind of ivory tower as a broadcaster. So I, I don't want that. I want the dialogue to continue, and we're going to continue that dialogue now, actually, with Dave in Chester, in Cheshire, beautiful city, actually. Um, Dave, voting, what do you think of it? Waste of time or democratic duty? Uh, good morning, first. Good morning. Uh, Hello. It's a, waste of, it's a waste, of waste of a vote in this country because the politicians do not listen they do not listen to the real people. I'm not a racist by any chance. I cast myself as middle of the field. Yeah. But the Germans from 1930 and now we're trying to get across the channel. We stopped them, yet we can't stop dinghies. What's going to say on? nothing of the Spanish Armada. Um, no, I, I, I know what you mean. It does, it does seem the, 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 the small boats issue. Is that the number one issue for you, Dave? Uh, that, that's, a, that's an issue. I live in the street, there's 32 houses, there's only four families, it's British. You know what I mean? Yeah, and a lot. It's a great, to be fair, there's Poles, the Poles are very nice people, but the rest of them, the Asians, don't mix with us. Right, right. So you, you, you know what I mean? And if, if I say something to them, I'm a racist because I'm a white working class ha, Have you tried to mix with them? Have you tried to invite them round or have a have a proper chat about the weather I or whatever? Me, I go on my way to talk to them. Yeah. But they just don't want to know. They look, they, they, that's as it sounds, the Asians look down at us. So is there no, is there no politician, um, Dave, that in this country that you think could, could help in some way or could, could try to... Is there no one at all that you would vote for in this country? No. I, I, okay. I honestly say there's not a politician in the country. It's, it's aptly named the members of parliament because it's a private club with 650 people in it and they do what they want to do. And God help us, I was a Labour supporter all my life, God help us next year when the Labour Party get in. Well, what's put you off them? Uh, Kirst Armour, he's got splinters in his backside, he sits on the fence that much. Uh, well, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn, was he was he someone you would have voted for? Well, he was just a waste of space. He wouldn't have a socialist if one landed on his head. 
Okay. Uh, well, Dave, um, I, I wish you well. Thanks for your thoughts on that. And there is there's a lot of frustration about this. Actually, uh, Howard Cox here, uh, Dinah, Nick and Sally have been in touch to say, forget him being London mayor, we want him to be Prime Minister. There we are. There are lots, uh, lots of views on that. Khaled is in Leicester. Khaled, I think I spoke to you yesterday and we had problems with the line. So it's good to have you back on. What would you like oh, yeah. to say this morning? Yeah, basically, I mean, as far as um, Israel and the hostage situation, I look, we well, have got to put it into perspective in the sense that, look, the, even the Israelis have taken many, many young children, imprisoned them for throwing stones at tanks, etc., for for a long, long time. You know, we, 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 the narrative seems to be that, you know, I mean, that's the... To defend... And oh, we're having problems with the line again, Khaled. Sorry. Sorry. Can Sorry. you not hear me? Uh, keep, keep going. We'll give it another go, Khaled. I do want to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I'm saying, look, the Palestinians have been oppressed for uh, too long now. We die on... We're, we're, just, we're just we're we're just struggling with a the line there again. Khaled, I do want you to have your say, I promise you, even though I think I'm probably going to disagree with you. But unfortunately, uh, we just we just have problems two days in a row now with the line to Khaled. Maybe we can get a better line to him some other time. Maybe it's his phone or his reception or something. Um, Roger has been in touch on Twitter. He says, if you don't agree with progressive left, you're branded far right. Uh, well, there we are. There are lots of people in touch about voting as well, including Jane, who says, perhaps in the voting paper, we need to put none of the above on the ballot paper. We, we need to go out and vote, says Jane, who wants to do her democratic duty. Anne is in Hertfordshire. Anne, you're very welcome to the programme. What would you like to say? Well, I think it's bizarre that journalists work for the BBC. I pay my TV license to the BBC. I'd like the journalist to stay, I'd like the journalist there to do his job that I'm paying him to do. And you feel they're not doing that? Yeah, and they're not doing that. They're stopping him doing his job. What 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 are they being stopped to do? They're stopping him doing his job. He's a journalist. He should be out there being a journalist. He should be doing the job he's being paid to do. Whether it's taking him to that or taking him to something else. I think I think they're fine he's, with he's covering out there to do his job. I think they're fine with covering. You know, if if crews and and uh, journalists are sent out to cover the the uh, marches, that's okay. It's actually going on and participating in the marches that uh, that. Uh, well, that's up to him as well. We live in a free society. If he wants to voice his opinion, that's up to him. So should should they be able to go to pro-Palestinian rallies? They do you should think? be able to go to whatever they want to go to. It's their downtime. They do whatever they want in their free time. But if you if you saw someone, you know, if you saw, uh, let's say, if you saw Clive Myrie, okay, the main presenter on the BBC on a pro-Palestinian march holding a placard, or alternatively yeah. on the march against anti-Semitism, wouldn't that sort of compromise him in terms of no, how he does his I mean, job? What he, what he, he was supporting the people that he believes in. He believes in that campaign and he's supporting it. He's putting okay. his support over. We're too worried in this country to say something. And he's saying how he feels. OK, and thanks very much for your thoughts there. That was just a hypothetical example, by the way, Clive Murray, as far as I know, has gone on neither of those protests, and we don't know his political views at all. I certainly don't anyway. But thank you to everybody who's been in touch this hour. There's lots more to talk about in the next hour as well, because before the end of the programme, Johnny Gould is coming up between 1 o'clock and 4 o'clock. But we're going to talk to Ben Pyle and Andrew Montford. Um, uh, ben Pyle is the co-founder of Climate Debate UK, and Andrew Montford is the deputy director of Net Zero Watch, because uh, a Tory MP says he wants to rectify Sunak's greatest mistake as head of Climate Watchdog. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the thoughts that Rishi's doing, rowing back slightly, not lots, but slightly on net zero might have been a mistake. Also, almost half of women transport workers are sexually harassed in the last year, according to the RMT union. Um, why can't people just do their jobs without being sexually harassed? It's horrendous. Let me know your thoughts on any of these issues or anything you think we should be talking about. 0344 499 1000. I can see the phones going here and I will take as many calls as I can between now and one o'clock. Get a variety of voices on. Even if Khaled wants to ring again, if he's got a decent phone line, he is more than welcome to do so. We just couldn't hear him uh, two days in a row, unfortunately. But listen, get, let us know your thoughts. As I say, 0344 499 1000. We will have Cat of the Week as well next hour before the end of the show. Tech Up Dave will be here. Stay with us. This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4 pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. We're here!
Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and radio. 7 o'clock Saturday night. James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Well, a very good afternoon. This is Talk TV. I'm Peter Cardwell. A pleasure to have your company. Thank you for joining me. Whether you've been with me for the last two hours or whether you're just joining me right now, thank you so much for that. Whether you're watching on Talk TV, whether you're listening on the radio, whether you're a smart speaker or watching on YouTube, whether it's three minutes past 12 or whether it's later in the day and you're catching up, you're very, very welcome. Remember, if you're listening, you can watch Sky 522, Virgin 606, Freeview 2337 and Freesat 217 by YouTube by the Talk TV app. Uh, there are lots of ways to watch and also lots of ways to get involved. 0344 499 1000 is the number to call. Take as many calls as I can between now and one o'clock. And also you can text me at 7222 with the word talk. Uh, thank you to Jane who says, Hi Peter, the best thing to do with the BBC is to make it go subscription so many never watch it. We've had a range of reactions to John Mayer as well, the uh, defender of the BBC. My favourite, uh, which is not very nice but is nonetheless quite funny, is Matthew says, BBC John is a bum head. Well, that's just not very nice, Matthew, but it is funny, and I'm sure John wouldn't mind because he is someone who can take a bit of criticism. I wonder if people will call me a bum head. I don't know, maybe they will. Uh, you can text me, talk up Dave is nodding, he would happily call me a bum head. Um, at uh, Talk TV on Twitter is how you can tweet me to call me a bum head if you want to, but please tweet something nice, uh, or you can follow me, of course, at Peter Cardwell. There's lots to discuss between now and one o'clock when Johnny Gould takes over. Stay with me here on Talk TV.
Well, the issue we're going to talk about now is quite a big one because a Conservative MP, this is Chris Skidmore, uh, you may not be familiar with him, but he has described Rishi Sunak's relaxation of net zero targets as the greatest mistake of his premiership. Do you agree with that? Do you think that Rishi Sunak's greatest mistake is relaxing net zero targets? Let me know. 0344 499 1000. Uh, now, um, Chris Skidmore is seeking minister's support to lead the official climate watchdog. Uh, he was the energy minister under Theresa May. He is on a short list of candidates to chair something called the Climate Change Committee, which is a body advising government on greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, it recommended in 2019 that ministers adopt a target for for net zero greenhouse gases by 2050. That's something that was relaxed a little bit. I mean, the target is still there, but the way that this country gets there is going to be something very different. Well, I'm delighted that Ben Pyle, who is the co-founder of the Climate Debate UK, and also Andrew Montford, who is Deputy Director of Net Zero Watch, are both with me now. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for coming on on this Sunday afternoon. Really appreciate it. Um, ben, maybe we'll start with you. Do you agree with uh, Chris Skidmore that this is the greatest mistake of Rishi Sunak? Premiership? Oh, no, of course not. No, I, in fact, I think Rishi Sunak's U turn, uh, so called, is probably the weakest possible uh, recognition of reality that, he, that, that he's committed to, but that there isn't less that he could do to. to um, to really work on the problems of of net zero, um, uh, the the, the, the all governments, all and all MPs seem to be committed to. Um, you, you know, to call it a U-turn is 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 a, is a wild exaggeration. And um, I think really what that speaks to is the, the the intolerance and intransigence that has developed around the green agenda um, by um, all parties and all MPs who, who just will brook no dissent, you know, so if, you know, anything can be called climate change denial or, you know, uh, 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 or, or, or something similar um, by people who are just so zealously committed to, to this agenda. Um, and, and that's what really needs reflection on. Um, uh, um, I think perhaps um, uh, Chris Skidmore needs to reflect a, a little bit more deeply on that. And, um, and more people need to be brought into reviews of net zero i mean it was just just left to one man to to uh is, is net zero review. desirable ban pile do you think it's something we should be doing as a country no it should be repealed tomorrow um or, or, or yesterday if that was possible um but the, there's no there's no reason for net zero the the urgency and alarm of the the environmental movement that that has been building for you know half a century or more um is is unfounded that's not to say there's no such thing as climate change but but the, the, this the, the panic that has been generated um, and the stories that have been generated have all turned out not to be true. And the the policies that have been made in attempt to avoid this uh, disaster uh, risk becoming far worse than climate change itself. Um, and and, I, and and that's thanks to people like Chris Skidmore who 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 won't listen to debate and who won't listen to other 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 perspectives on on this question um, and 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 therefore seem you know in, in, in inevitably to take us to worse and worse policies as indeed to re, it was the case under Theresa May's uh, Prime Ministership. She, she's the one who instigated net zero as something of a, a quite a malicious parting shot, if I may say so. Andrew Monfort, what do you make of this at uh, Net Zero Watch? Well, yeah, I think Ben has got sort of touched on quite an interesting point there. Um, the, the Climate Change Committee, al although it's ostensibly about advising the, the government on, on decarbonisation, in reality, it, it, it's, it's steering a gravy train. I mean, Chris Skidmore has huge financial interests in in um, the decarbonisation agenda, he he gets something like eighty thousand pounds a year from a, a company involved in decarbonisation. Oh, it's sure, very I'm sure interesting. Would, I'm sure he would say there's no uh, there's no impropriety well, there whatsoever. Okay, but no, okay. Well, let me let you know, I'm, I, I dare say he will drop those interests at the time. <laughs> but if you go back to Lord Deben, the previous chairman of the of the uh, climate change committee, when he was appointed, he too had lots of interests in. Um, green industry, and he told Parliament he would get rid of them. And 
A couple of years later, it was found that, well, no, he still had some financial interests and there was an investigation and they said, no, that was OK. You know, it was all a terrible mistake and no impropriety, nothing wrong. And then a few years after that, it was found out that he had a company that was also taking um, lots of money from uh, um, green interests. We have the, the, the chairman of the Adaptation Committee of the Climate Change Committee, who's the director of a wind farm company. The whole thing absolutely stinks. Just to continue in that vein, I'm aware that there of another candidate for the to be the the, the committee, the, the chairman of the committee on climate change, who has eminently well qualified, who has been completely sidelined, and they even went to the extent of appointing um, an interim chairman so that they didn't have to appoint somebody who had no interest. They, they it, it looks like they have been absolutely scraping around trying to find somebody who is going to keep that gravy train going. Skidmore should not be appointed. If he is appointed, then it is the government sticking up two fingers to the public and saying, we are going to do what is good he, for the green well, blob, well, not for the public. Well, Chris Skidmore, of course, is not here to defend himself, Ben Pyle, but he would say that he has, uh, you know, a very long interest in this, lots of expertise and so on, and is the man perhaps to defend uh, the uh, the climate, the, to defend net zero as a concept. Um, can you think of a better candidate for this committee? Perhaps you don't think this committee should exist, but it is a statutory body advising government on greenhouse gas emissions, the Climate Change Committee. Yeah, no, it shouldn't exist. It was created by the 2008 Climate Change Act, and I've been pointing out to various parliamentary uh, 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 agencies since then that there are conflict, there are these conflicts of interest, right from the, the word dot. Um, uh, Nick Stern, the, 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 the professor of economics, who wrote the uh, original uh, document for you know for, for the Labour government on 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 the economics of climate change, um, and 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 therefore. Ben, ben I'm, I'm I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you there. We just have some breaking news, which I'm sure you will uh, appreciate me uh, breaking the conversation just for a second. The former England manager Terry Venables has died at the age of 80. Uh, he is still regarded, of course, as one of the greatest managers to ever serve the national team, taking England to the semi-finals at Euro 96 at Wembley. That is the breaking news that Terry Venables, the former England manager, has died at the age of 80. He played alongside some of the greats of the game. He made more than 200 appearances for Chelsea and at least 100 more for Tottenham in the 1960s. A fantastic player, as well as a manager who many thought was excellent as well. He's perhaps best known as a manager rather than a player. He won the FA Cup with Tottenham in 1991. He guided Barcelona to European Cup final in 1986 as well. So that is the breaking news here at 12 minutes past 12 here on Talk TV that the former England manager Terry Venables has died at the age of 80 in 2010. Away from working in the field, he actually recorded a special cover of Elvis Presley's hit If I Can Dream with the London Philharmonic Orchestra alongside the Sun newspaper ahead of the World Cup in South Africa. So he's a man who could uh, to have a have a laugh as well as someone who was uh, very serious, of course, about football. Um, he was uh, he played for Chelsea, Tottenham, QPR. He went on to manage clubs, as I said, including Barcelona, Spurs, Crystal Palace. He was known as El Tel, of course. That was how many people referred to him. Uh, not le not just because he managed Barcelona. He led England at the Euro ninety at Euro ninety six as the country hosted the tournament and reached the semi final. So it's a very sad news that at the age of just eighty, uh, Terry Venables, the former England manager, has died at the age of eighty. Um, we are going to have full coverage of that between now and one o'clock, of course. Uh, we will be speaking to Tom Clayton, the talk sport reporter, about Terry Venable's career. We can see, if you're watching on Talk TV, uh, some footage of him now, both as a player and indeed a manager. Uh, he was someone who was uh, something of a wordsmith as well, gave quite a few uh, entertaining interviews, always with a smile on his face. Certainly someone I remember growing up uh, watching Terry Venables, uh, mainly as a manager, of course. It was probably before I was born that he was uh, a player. But after the break, we will uh, talk to uh, talk sport reporter um, Tom Clayton about that. We'll have other guests as well between now and one o'clock. Apologies to Ben Pyle and Andrew Montford, but I'm sure you, they will both appreciate that that breaking news that Terry Venables has very sadly died at the age of 80 is uh, breaking news here on Talk TV. We'll continue to cover that between now and one, but a break first. We're here! 
Hi. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda is zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> if you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> yeah. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm I'll come. I'm just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Well, the breaking news this hour is that the England, uh, the former England football manager Terry Venables has died at the age of 80. Uh, two guests who know football back to front are Tom Clayton, who is a reporter for Talk Sport, and also Johnny Gould, who is uh, you come in a little bit early. Uh, of course, <laughs> he's here between 1 o'clock and 4 o'clock, but Johnny, of course, knows football backwards, so we grabbed him as soon as this broke. Very sad news, Johnny. It is sad, and what a massive character Terry Venables was in public life for about six decades, a Chelsea footballer, a Spurs and England manager. Spurs are playing this afternoon against Villa. I'm sure it will send uh, lots of shockwaves through, this, the, through the, uh, the stadium. I'm sure it'll be a catalyst for a Spurs performance playing Villa today. And, of course, England manager famously at Euro 96, uh, the nearly manager, like so many England managers since Sir Alf Ramsey, England reaching the semi-finals and getting knocked out against, of course, Germany on penalties. Yes, <laughs> so close. And actually, I saw recently that wonderful play, Dear England, uh, with where Gareth Southgate sort of gets over the, the trauma of it and so on. And, and of course, Terry Venables is portrayed in that. Tom Clayton is a talk sport reporter. Very sad news here today. Uh, we just, This has just emerged in the last few minutes. It has, and we... we but, you know, it's very sad, and we, we've been talking about it on Talk Sport. We got some rumblings this morning that it might have happened. Now it has officially been confirmed. Um, a statement issued on behalf of the Venables family reads, We're totally devastated by the loss of a wonderful husband and father who passed away peacefully yesterday after a long illness. We would ask that any privacy be given at this incredibly sad time uh, to allow them to mourn this lovely man who was so they were so lucky to have in their lives. And... It, it, it's very true. He wasn't just known for being a footballer and a manager. He was known as being a wonderful man off the pitch. He was involved in so much in public life. And I remember, you know, 
I appreciate I'm a member of the younger generation. I don't necessarily remember much of his time uh, certainly playing or managing in, in any aspects that other people might. But, you know, you hear about these wonderful ethereal managers who have so much so much good to give to the world and Terry Venables was certainly one of those I remember in 2010 he made the uh, he made one of the official anthems of the World Cup in England's bid to, to win a second World Cup in 2010 when he re-released a cover of If I Can Dream by Elvis <laughs> Presley uh, he recorded the video with a 60p with, with 60 members of the London Philharmonic Orchestra on top of the Millennium Dome <laughs> and it was just the most remarkable yes. thing and he was such a wonderful man to have done that and that's one of my kind of overriding memories of him you know as I say I, I won't have seen him well I might have seen him when yeah. I was very very small yes. uh, you know doing the 1996 well, Euros. Well, I'm, but... I'm the same I mean I never saw him as a, as a player but he was certainly a big figure and remained a big figure Johnny Gould didn't he and strikes me with that example that Tom gave us there as someone who took football of course very very seriously but perhaps himself not that seriously he always seemed to have a smile on his face and a bit of a joke for people. He was from that generation of managers with the big overcoats the sort of Malcolm Allison's and the big fedoras and he took Crystal Palace from the second division into the first division in the late 70s and that was the catalyst for him to become a bit of a tabloid star and he was always courting the sort of sun in the mirror and he became a bit of a ledge in that way he then did the same at queen's park rangers i'm remembering this in real time as a as a young kid into football and then somehow he became barcelona manager and he won them the title in the early 80s and it was the first trophy that barcelona had won for 11 years was that, a bit, was that a bit weird at that stage? It was. was. Was there a lot of were there a lot of England manager, England uh, English, I should say, managers going out to to other parts of the world, especially a, a very big and important club like Barcelona. It was exactly that. It was a new adventure. Barcelona had English managers, but a hundred years ago, when football was being exported to the world from England, the yes. Sheffield rules. We've got this game with round ball, don't you know? Okay, very nice. <laughs> so, but Terry Venables came there when Spain became better than us. Yes, yes, and and then led them to. The the title Gary Lineker Steve Archibald all those players then went to Barcelona and then he came back and managed Gaza and Gary at Spurs again they didn't quite win the title they finished third this is in the 1990s and then he got his chance to become England manager by which time he was a bit of a controversial figure because Sir Alan Sugar as he was at that time then he became Lord Sugar kicked him out what, what was their beef? What, 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 what went on there to um, remind us about um, that? Well, uh, we won't go over old ground, but there was uh, there were financial issues that Lord Sugar didn't like on the balance sheet. Right. And uh, Terry, even so, that was part of uh, how he was remembered at the time. Still got the England job and actually inspired an England side to the semi-final when we didn't look like we were going to do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that was a team with Stuart Pearce and... Paul Gascoigne and Darren Anderson and, and some David big, Platt. very big personalities. David there. Seaman. Were, were they easy to manage? Uh, the the sort of uh, Pierces and and Gazes of this world. Yeah, I think Stuart Pierce was a bit of a self starter, <laughs> and he had a little bit of a a, a a thing to deal with, which was he missed a terrible penalty at Italia ninety. Yes. And then he came back and uh, he scored the penalty against Spain, and he went absolutely crazy in a way that get out of the way Stuart Pierce is celebrating. Yes. But then. The current England manager, Gareth Southgate, missed a vital penalty. I remember penalty. it well. You know all about I remember it. it well. And the great thing about Terry Venables is we'll all remember how he took Gareth Southgate and held his head and I remember hey, that, hey, yeah. because that's what Venables was. He was a human being manager. You know, he wasn't a, a tactician in that way. I mean, I'm not saying he wasn't a great tactician. He yes. knew his football. But he didn't expect the impossible. But there was, there was a humanity mm -hmm. about El Tell. And that was his nickname, El Tell. El Tell. So that, it, did that come from the Barcelona link? It came from way? Barcelona. Yeah, By the way, yeah. Howard Kendall then went over. It's not remembered. He went to Athletic Bilbao and he became El Kell. El Kell, right. So, <laughs> but just, just not as well remembered. Not as quite so. as remembered. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll miss him. And he hasn't been well for a number of years. And, of course, he was on with... Des Lynham in the noughties doing Champions League football on ITV. Yes, and, uh, of course. They yeah. basically chuckled their way through sort of half-time and full-time as though they'd started their big match dinner after the game. You can imagine <laughs> them going out in Rome, yeah, 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 yeah. It's going out laughing like Sid James, both of them having a great time. And it was, it was very engaging stuff. Des, approximately the greatest sports broadcaster of all time. <laughs> it really is. And with El Tell, 
it was it was great stuff yeah. and uh, you know you can't have that anymore and we were all politically correct and probably can't have Des and Tell on anymore. No you can't. You which can't. is a shame because it was a great watch. He was, wasn't Des Lennon the one who said uh, some of you might have heard there's a football match on tonight? Yes. Uh, yeah with the, well, that was the semi-final of that was the, It was Italia yeah. 90. Yeah ta oh Italia 90 yeah. yeah I remember yeah I remember they did they actually did um, a Pizza Hut ad uh, mm -hmm. when they had Stuart Pearce and, um, Southgate. and Southgate and Stuart Pearce saying miss can we get the, <laughs> can we get the menu? Miss. So don't worry it only took me six years to get over it. Which is um, lovely because this is the golden age of football mm. and if only we could return to some of the bonhomie and laughter that there was around the game. Was it less serious then? Was it was it more more fun? Yes, it, I think it was. And, it and he was, was also, a character, El Tell was a, was a character who brought fun to it, wasn't it? It was. And it was the era of the Premier League we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And uh, suddenly the Premier League sort of professionalised the old first division. And these guys were saying, oh, we've got a few quid here suddenly. Yeah. And they brought in players from around the world, Ruth Khalid and Gianluca Vialli and Thomas Brolin. And Venables was still managing. He managed Leeds United and Middlesbrough towards the end of his... Uh, career and then took on the mantle of being a pundit and he was good at that as well so yeah. rest in peace Terry Venables. Um, we're going to um, if you have uh, memories of Terry Venables do give us a shout 0344 499 1000 is the number to call uh, we definitely want to hear some voices some tributes to Terry Venables um, uh, we've, we've got quite a few people uh, in touch including um, someone saying, uh, Leighton says, sad to hear about Terry Venables passing, a true great. He was also the co-writer of the Hazel books, which became a TV series uh, starring Nicholas Ball. Is that correct? That's correct. And also had a, he had a sing-song. He was like your dad at a wedding. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't the best thing he did, but he really fancied himself. They had this great self-confidence. This sort of Top of the Pops pictures where he's singing away. And it, like, this is before karaoke. Yes. He would have been fine at karaoke. But but that would have been a better but, you know, time. Come on, mate. You know. in, in many skills, but perhaps singing wasn't one of them. <laughs> he was okay. Uh, yeah, someone else actually Stephen London makes that point about the TV series Hazel and what, what was that series what it was, was a 70s detective show <laughs> really um, and wow yeah I mean you know because everything was detectives in those days yes yeah I'll sort this out no problem in 59 minutes and 50 seconds yeah. mate no well, problem well I, I used to love the Sweeney get your dresses yeah. on you're Nick you're Nick yeah. yeah. and they were called mysteriously Regan and Carter before those two were presidents <laughs> that's right that's yes, so that's weird right. that is weird isn't it yeah you're Nick John, John Thaw and uh, shat it yeah, yeah. Uh, Dan and Ken says sad news Terry Venable was a uh, fantastic personality uh, really unlucky not to bring it home how unlucky was he not to bring it home um, because obviously we think that because uh, we all want England to win and even though I'm not from England not a big football person I certainly want England to win at Euro 96 but how, how close was it and how devastating was that uh, looking back on that time oh I was at the game tell. you were at the game I was at the game I was at all the Euro 96 games and it was Gaza's toe and he lurched for a sort of grass cutting cross my eyes are closed thinking about it and he just arrived a bit late. He couldn't believe the ball had come in. And he just oh, didn't quite get to it. And then it was penalties. And we lost on penalties. Mm -hmm. But we took good penalties. Uh, but we missed one. And it yes. was Gareth's penalty yes. that we missed. And then, as Badil and Skinner narrated in their Euro 98, uh, World Cup 98 song which was um, that we should have won it. It was the Germans against the Czech Republic in the final. And, of course, we would have beaten the Czech Republic. Yes. We would have beaten them, like, 4-0. They shouldn't have been there. They were the 80-1 <laughs> outsiders, but they got yes. through. And it was Germany again. Mm, mm. It was again. Adding, adding, oh, no. Adding to the At Wembley. 30, 40, 50, 60 oh, years of course. And we still yeah. haven't won it. No, I know. We um, lost in the final at Euro 2020. I know, I, I remember it's watching it. It's terrible. Yeah. Anne says, uh, Peter, so sorry to hear the sad news of Terry Venables, one of life's good guys who never took himself too seriously. And uh, my last, uh, yeah, uh, or, uh, um, yes, rest in respect, says Dan as well, not just rest in, in peace, but rest in respect as well. What was he like as a player? Because um, obviously um, I, I knew he was a player, but I didn't know the chronology of it. My football knowledge is, is pretty limited. I'd be the first person to say that. But Chelsea, Tottenham, QPR as well, what, what, what was his what was his legacy he like as a player? player. Other people, yeah. yeah, he was a good player. He's probably a better manager, but a good player. He played mm -hmm. with Jimmy Greaves at Chelsea, and it was that sort of Kings Road thing going on at Chelsea in the sixties. Look, she's got a lovely miniskirt, <laughs> and I'm sure he had a, an eye for the women as well, and uh, probably did. And um, uh, look, he was part of that sort of showbiz era, and Chelsea were good. Yes, um, and he also played at Spurs. They had a bit of a showbiz sort of element to them. Queen Spot Rangers less so, but we'll, they <laughs> yes. don't mind. They don't mind. But you're right with um, Chelsea. I mean, especially during that era, the sort of Mary Quant and the roaring, roaring, the, the yeah, sort of sixties and seventies, in and around yeah. all the yeah. laughter and fun. Yeah, um, and 
yeah, it just sort of stayed with him. He was that sort of guy. He had a he had like a sort of nightclub in in Kensington High Street called Scribes West as well. <laughs> really? Yeah, and he used to sort of call all the journalists. Goodness which me. is approximately the reason why I became England manager because they were all on his side. Right, okay, they'd all got um, the but free he was just drinks. Sort of part of the kind of. Um, the sort of collusion between the, the, the football media, and not all of them, because Graham Taylor wasn't. Yes. Um, Graham Taylor used to get turnipped and sweeded up on the back pages because Graham was a slightly more provincial character, a bit more about football and learning and being more more diligent and about... And he wasn't sort of mates with these guys, whereas Terry was, you know, he was a Londoner and he yes. had that swagger. Uh-huh. And, of course, he was like those guys. I mean, I think he probably had the talent to be a writer as well. He, he did, well, but, I mean, yeah. I think he would have been a very good... He would have been a very good football journalist, Well, well Terry. Anna's been in touch to say, here's was a brilliant series, and yes, I am that old um, <laughs> as well. And uh, Gaza in Yorkshire says, uh, Peter L. Tell was my hope in 96, RIP, oh. the big V as well. Uh, I think, do we have a statement, um, Dave? Um, uh, it uh, has been WhatsApped to me, which I'm going to uh, read here. No doubt there will be all sorts of people who are um, paying tribute and so on uh, to Terry Venables. It hasn't come up on my WhatsApp. I think there might be a connection problem. Someone could perhaps print that for me. Uh, Chris, the producer, is bringing it in here. Uh, there are certainly a lot of people paying tribute to Terry Venables. And on Twitter as well, I'm sure you're seeing uh, quite a lot of reaction, Johnny, in terms of uh, the big the big figures. Um, so we have... Um, here we are. Yes, the League Managers Association Chief Executive Richard Bevan has said the League Managers Association is deeply saddened to hear of the passing of a League Managers Association member and former League Managers Association President Terry Venables. Our thoughts are very much with the vet and all of Terry's family at this time. And, uh, of course, that is... Uh, he made over 500 appearances for Chelsea and uh, they are... They have also said, um, we are truly devastated by the loss of a wonderful husband and father who passed away. This is his family. Passed away peacefully yesterday after a long illness. That's the family statement on uh, Terry Venables. We would ask that privacy be given at this incredibly sad time to allow us to mourn the loss of this lovely man who we were so lucky to have had in our lives. I think we were pretty lucky as a as a nation to have had him in our lives as well, Johnny. Yeah, absolutely. And I think he can say, even though, you know, the kind of major trophy that he won actually was in Spain, which kind of was his big reputational big one. He wasn't Sir Alex Ferguson in terms of yes. winning all the time Arsene Wenger. He did fulfil his his great career. He did manage everywhere he wanted to. And uh, he was a great TV personality as well. So um, he wasn't quite the football man in the orthodox sense of being at one club for a long time. Although, as you say, at Chelsea, he spent most of his senior career there. But as a manager and as a sort of personality, he was sort of Slightly bigger than the 90 minutes, wasn't he? He was a, yes, he was a singer, a writer, and a, and a TV personality, and we'll miss him. Um, Peter, great to hear this interview all done with a laugh. Terry would have loved it. Uh, great, says what a Cyril, compliment. Which is nice. Also, someone says, is that Harry Hill talking about El Tell? Um, That's nice. I'll, I'll put, my, I'll put my jacket on and, and take the pens out the top of it. <laughs> um, quite a lot of people saying it's great listening to you. I'm full of nostalgia. I mean, what are, what are the memories that you'll have? What are the kind of key moments of his of his managing career? Obviously, you were there for a lot of it in terms of the England matches, Johnny. It must you must have be thinking about a lot of things. Uh, you must have a lot of memories thinking today of of the great things that uh, Terry Venables achieved. I think the greatest moment was in the group stages when England beat Holland 4-1 and we sent them home. <laughs> Holland. Yes. And we yes. thrashed them. Uh-huh. And it was 4-1. And it was 4-0 at one point. And we played beautifully, Sheringham and Shearer scoring all the goals. And Holland with that great team in the orange. We're sending them home, this great Holland who was supposed to win this tournament. Holland scored a consolation goal, I think, through Bergkamp right at the end which rather comically, on goal difference, sent Scotland home. Right. Goodness, okay. <laughs> so all, all of that sort of together, my goodness. Um, which, is, which is, of course, the joke in football, which is that our song was Three Lions. Yes. And Scotland's uh, World Cup song is Three Games. <laughs> <laughs> goodness me. Uh, Kenny has been in touch from Edinburgh. He said, uh, hi, Cardi P. If Terry Venables had stayed as manager, England would have won uh, the World Cup. Mm. He had that X factor of success. In 2002, he says, a successful manager, uh, he had that X factor a successful manager needs. He made me cry at Euro 96, but was such a classy guy. It was hard to hate him for it. And that's from a Scotsman, Johnny. Fair play. Thank you very much. 
a Terry non McVenables. <laughs> non McVenables. A scourge yes. of Scotland. <laughs> Absolutely. If you're just joining us, we have that breaking news this lunchtime that Terry Venables, the former England manager and a very good player, of course, as well, has died at the age of 80. I'm delighted that Johnny Gould has very quickly uh, and kindly uh, n- uh, nipped into the studio to talk about him, which we're going to do for a few more minutes. And if you have memories, do text them in at 7 222. Terry Venables, 80 years old, sadly, uh, no longer with us, but a lot to remember and a lot to celebrate from a life well lived uh, quite a character so do give me a ring if you want to talk about him uh, 0344 499 1000 you can text me on 87 222 uh, you can uh, put the word talk in your text so it comes up in the screen in front of me or you can tweet me at talk tv or follow me at peter cardwell and uh, uh, texting is what one person has done l tell was responsible for the best performance i've ever seen from an england team against the dutch in euro 96 and that was exactly what johnny was just talking about there and uh, that will well, that will go down as a as a, a wonderful memory for so many people looking back on Terry Venables today. Absolutely right. That that tactical victory over Holland was, I think, his greatest moment. I mean, of course, he managed for so long. Peter Ridsdale was the Leeds United chairman when they were top of the league, and he played tennis with Terry. He had a great way of building a relationship, and Peter Ridsdale liked to be sold to. <laughs> right now, okay. Peter Peter wasn't at Leeds for very long. And he said, I played tennis with him and he made me feel like beyond ball. That was approximately the quote. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, well, blimey. And I thought, no wonder you got the Leeds job. <laughs> um, yes, indeed. And he wasn't there for very long. And I think he managed, oh, he, he managed with Brian Robson at Middlesbrough. And they did their very best to get on because they were, you know, they were both the alpha males and yes. Brian was from the younger generation. And uh, it didn't quite work out in the way that they were hoping and this was towards the end of his managerial career it's it's no stain on his career at all but i mean you know yeah. you want if your team was struggling of course you know you'd want someone like an elder statesman to come in and sort it out a bit like sam allardyce tried to do at leeds united yeah so if you get you get the older guys in to fix the defense up Indeed. and then you realize you haven't got the players and, and you <laughs> go a, down that's approximately what happened slight issue uh, we've had tottenham of course was uh, the team uh, probably the team apart from the england team that, that terry venables was was most associated with of course he played for them and uh, managed them as well they're going to hold a minute's applause and players will wear black armbands this is the fixture later on at home and i can assure uh, you the aston villa fans will join in of course absolutely they will. yeah and uh, they're going to be wearing black armbands at, uh, they're at home to aston villa they're at white hart lane uh, we are extremely saddened to learn of the passing of terry venables our former player manager and chief executive who passed away said a club statement we extend our sincere condolences at this sad time to terry's wife yvette his close family and friends well martin ziegler who is the chief sports reporter at the times is on the line now um, martin thank you for joining us i uh, really appreciate you uh, doing so at short notice because very very uh, sad news in that terry venables has died uh, what is your reaction to that news uh, well he, he i knew he'd been poorly um for, for quite a long time and that uh so it's probably for his family obviously a very sad moment but i think they were, they were sort of building up to it uh, it wasn't a sort of um it didn't come out of the blue but uh, nonetheless it is a sort of very sad moment one of the sort of preeminent figures in in, in english football in, in the 80s and the 90s um very influential he managed barcelona brought that his own sort of brand of attractive football um back to britain after that and then became the england manager of course and i think there's probably english football's got um you know a, a lot to thank uh, terry venables for because i think before that there was a it was english football wasn't wasn't the most attractive um game to watch and he he probably did as much as anybody to change that how did he change it what how did he make it a more attractive game what were the the skills and experience and and, and uh, panache that he brought to it because he was a larger than life character yeah i think he he sort of valued technical players skillful players um i mean he, you know he, he was certainly a pragmatist so that if there was like a a, a defender who he thought was um Need, needed to come in then who was like going to be sort of tough and do a job and obviously he'd do that but I think he he valued the sort of the, the, the technical players in his his Crystal Palace teams when he first started out uh, managing um won a lot of plaudits uh and he and I think instead of the sort of quite defensively minded English game long ball tactics which quite a lot of teams had played in the 80s 
and indeed the early 90s. In fact, his, you know, his predecessor, Graham Taylor at England, he was almost the sort of one of the architects of that sort of style. So it was a complete change when Terry Venables took over. Um, very refreshing and sort of at that time, um, Euro 96, especially when there was a sort of you know, Britpop was booming um, and they sort of caught the mood of the nation in many ways. And I think that was a lot, a lot down to his approach um, to the to football, um, to the, with the way he thought the game should be played. And of course, you know, you know, he, Gareth Southgate, the current England manager, he saw in him somebody who was a sort of ball playing centre half and he brought him into the team. Yes, indeed. Uh, we have some reaction from Gary Lineker, who uh, Venable signed for Barcelona from Everton in 1986, then, of course, brought to Tottenham in 1989 after Venables took the job at White Hart Lane. And uh, Gary Lineker has paid his tribute to say, devastated to hear that Terry Venables has died, the best, most innovative coach that I had the privilege and pleasure of playing for he wrote on Twitter he was much more though than just a great manager he was vibrant he was charming he was witty he was a friend he will be hugely missed sending love and condolences to Yvette and the family R.I.P. Terry and there is this uh, thread not just of footballing brilliance um, that we're that we of course know about Terry Venables but is being remembered today as well Martin uh, Ziegler the vibrant charming witty side of Terry Venables is being remembered as well not least by uh, Gary Lineker yeah, I mean, he was, you know, when you when you met him, um, as I did a, a few times, I covered his press conferences, you know, he was somebody who was in a twinkle in his eye, very, very sharp, very funny, very droll. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he, he was very popular with everybody just because he he knew how to make people um, settle, settle in, um, always good with a quip, kept cool, um, obviously... A, uh, 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 an Essex boy who um, loved a joke and was very, very, very witty with it. Uh, tell us a little bit about his relationship with some of the players. We have uh, one uh, texter who said the relationship in Gaza and Venables was legendary. Let's just r r remind ourselves, Martin, about this. Yeah, so I mean, if, you, if you think um, Gaza had problems with both of them, um, Graham Taylor, dropped him for a few matches, Glenn Hoddle, um, who took over from Terry Venables, he didn't take him to the next World Cup very controversially, but with Terry Venables, um, Gaza was a key member of his of his England team. Um, he brought the best out of him. Uh, he relished everything Paul Gascoigne stood for into, on the pitch um, in terms of that sort of creativity. And yet, as you say, he had a, Gary Lindica as well, Venables saw him in him, someone who could make a a huge difference both for Barcelona and Spurs and actually Gary Lineker was probably the, the, the best striker of his generation um, got uh, I think he was the top scorer at two World Cups and you know Venable saw in him something which he um, you know he could build on it and for his clubs and he did um, very very successfully. Um, thank you so much, Martin Ziegler there, who is Chief Sports Reporter at The Times. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, and indeed joining us at short notice uh, with the breaking news that Terry Venables, the former England manager, has died at the age of 80. Quite a lot of reaction, as you can imagine, from many people in the world of sport. Chris Kamara, for example, gutted to hear Terry Venables has passed away. Top player and a fantastic manager. I got to know the person, and he was a great bloke. Great memories of being with him in his club scribes in Kensington back in the late 90s. R.I.P. Terry, and he did have a he did have a nightclub as well, larger than life character. We were hearing Johnny Gould talk about that. And Johnny Gould is coming up between one o'clock and four o'clock. Very kindly nipped into the studio whilst doing preparation for his show. No doubt he will be reflecting on the amazing life of Terry Venables. Alan Shearer, uh, the uh, incredible England star himself, and of course now footballing pundit. Extremely sad news: the great Terry Venables has passed away. R.I.P. Boss. I owe you so much. You were amazing, says Alan Shearer. Tottenham Hotspur, the club that, uh, of course, uh, Terry Venables played for and managed and was chief executive of. The club is extremely saddened to learn of the passing of former player and manager Terry Venables. Our deepest condolences are with Terry's friends and family at this incredibly difficult time. In tribute, we shall hold a minute's applause prior to kickoff, and our players will wear black armbands during this afternoon after this afternoon's fixture against Aston Villa. I would imagine the Aston Villa uh, players will all be uh, taking part in that applause as well. Probably. 
wearing black armbands too. Rest in peace, Terry, Aston Villa says. Uh, actually, everyone at Aston Villa is deeply saddened by the passing of former England manager Terry Venables. Ahead of kick-off against Terry's former club, Tottenham Hotspur, this afternoon, a minute's applause will take place in his memory. The thoughts and condolences of all at the club are with his family and friends at the time. We've had reaction from right across the sporting world. We've had uh, Gary Lineker, uh, Tottenham Hotspur as a club. Uh, we've had a reaction from his family as well. I'll just read you their statement just briefly before we go to the break. Um, I have it here on WhatsApp, so forgive me from reading from my phone. Uh, oh no, I have it in front of me here. We are totally devastated, Terry Venable's family say, by the loss of a wonderful husband and father who passed away peacefully yesterday after a long illness, uh, they have said in a family statement. We would ask that privacy be given at this incredibly sad time to allow us to mourn the loss of this lovely man who we were so lucky to have had in our lives. And Nevin in Cobham has also been in touch on text to say that he came to Mournview Park in Lurgan in Northern Ireland that, uh, to, um, for a pre-season friendly with Glenavon, that is the, a local club that my father and brother support actually, but Nevin has just uh, texted this in. Uh, pre-season friendly, Glenavon versus Spurs in about 1991 I think. We were opening a new stand behind one of the goals. Kerry, Terry cut the tape, saluted the Glenavon supporters of which I was one and didn't stop signing autographs and shaking hands. He was a classy guy. Uh, so even if it was a, a much a club much further down the league uh, that they were playing a friendly with with Spurs in 1991, still Terry Venables took the time to see people, to talk to people and be, as Nevin says, a classy guy. We'll be reflecting further on Terry Venables' incredible life and contribution, not just to football, but also to our nation. Next, here on Talk TV. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to use the XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a minute. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are Absolutely you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that.
Well, I just want to reflect with one more guest on the life of Terry Venables. And thanks to everybody who's been in touch with their memories, paying tribute to the former England manager who has very sadly died, aged 80. That is Ben Jacobs, who is a football journalist, is with me now. Uh, ben, thanks for joining us, especially on short notice. This very sad news that Terry Venables has died. And of course, there'll be tributes throughout the sport. There have been tributes throughout the sporting world. But how do you see his career? How will you remember him, Ben? Well, I think me, like many, will remember him as a manager. We know that he was the England manager during Euro 96 when England almost won it. They lost to Germany in the semi-finals, Gareth Southgate. Now the England manager famously missed that penalty, but it's about as close as England have come to major silverware in the men's game. But the funny thing about Terry is that he will be remembered more as a manager, but he made 500 plus appearances as a player yeah. as well. You've got to remember that too. You've got to remember his whole life. Yeah. And yeah, he won the League Cup with Chelsea. He won an FA Cup with Spurs as a player. And I think some of that success, even though he was forced to retire due to arthritis, is down to the fact that he was always a people person as a player and as a manager. And his style was quite unique. He was forthright as a manager, he was vocal as a player, but at the same time, he was amenable and he was a people person. And the games that he played for so many clubs then set him up to go into management where he made his name, both internationally, he also managed Australia as well. We know that he did great things with QPR too. And I don't think there's anybody in football again ever that will go from Queen's Park Rangers to Barcelona as a manager. But Venables did that. He guided up QPR from the second division to the first division whilst they were still in the second division. They got to an FA Cup final that they lost to Tottenham. And then he went to Barcelona and he won La Liga and he nearly won the European Cup as well. And that's where he got the nickname El Tel. So usually when you get a manager with such a diverse CV, it tells you that they're liked within the game. It tells you that they're amenable and a tactician he as well. He was definitely a character as well. I mean, you, you mentioned his sort of larger-than-life persona. We've been hearing so much about his club scribes as well. Chris Kamara uh, paying tribute to him on Twitter, uh, talking about that, not just about his, his being a top player and a fantastic manager. But there was, there was so much to his character, Ben, wasn't there? There was, and I think handling some of the players that he had to, like Paul Gascoigne, for example, required a forthright personality. <laughs> big, big personalities, yeah. Exactly, but he had a great sense of humour as well. And I remember straight after Gareth Southgate missed the penalty at Euro 96, Venables was the first player going over to him and Southgate had kind of buried his head in his shirt and Venables went over, gave him a hug, put his arms around him and acted more like a father figure yeah. than necessarily a manager. And that again was innate within his personality. There were other aspects that were slightly more controversial. For example, he was in a long running court battle with Tottenham. He tried to buy the club originally he then fell out with the new owner at the time Alan Sugar and again it shows you the forthright nature it shows you the ambition it shows you the desire to kind of change football as a player as a coach and even at an executive level as well so he was highly ambitious but he was extremely warm and friendly at the same time and that balance in football is very rare how do you think he'll be remembered I think he'll be remembered as a manager rather than a player, but we should think of both. And the beauty when you have such affiliations with a diverse array of clubs is each club will remember him differently. Chelsea will remember him for lifting the League Cup. International fans will always remember a home Euros that England almost won. But I think the overriding unity between everything that he did was success and ambition because as a player there was silverware as a manager there was almost international honors and domestically he did so much for clubs like spurs and qpr in particular yeah. also crystal palace we should mention as well so i think that terry will be remembered as a man manager he'll be remembered as somebody that really drove a coaching style from the top down he wasn't a grassroots coach he wasn't necessarily a science-based coach he was very much a players coach that took individuals by the scruff of the neck almost <laughs> but with warmth yes. and made sure that they knew what their job was and when you get that clarity it can often bring the best out of a player and I think that many players will remember him for the personal interest that he took in their careers. Ben thank you what a great tribute uh, Ben Jacobs is a football journalist thank you very much for that uh, many many people have been reacting I'm just going to read out one more tribute and then we're going to move on uh, but Terry Venables has died at the age of 80 and uh, one of the tributes is from Chelsea Football 
Club, of course, he had a long association with them. Everyone at Chelsea Football Club is deeply saddened to learn of the passing of former Blue Terry Venables, aged 80, says Chelsea. The thoughts and condolences of everyone at the club are with his family and friends at this difficult time. Rest in peace, Terry. And we absolutely uh, are, uh, he, all of us here at Talk TV um, have those sentiments as well. An amazing character, an amazing man. So uh, we remember Terry Venables. And of course, there'll be continuing coverage. Johnny Gould, who knows an awful lot, was talking about him there, will continue this coverage. But we're going to uh, move on to other topics now, uh, whilst we, of course, remember uh, Terry Venables. But uh, Tech Up Dave is here just at the tail end of the show. Hello, sir. How are hello. you? Hello, yes. Uh, what was I supposed to call you? Oh, yes. Hello, Bob. Bumhead. Bumhead, yes, yes. No, there'd you be said plenty of people. Wanted to call you well, that. well, that's very kind you of go. you. And you have also given me the fingers today, which is very would kind. Would you like another one? I would actually, yes. Thank you very much indeed. There's got some chocolate fingers here, so uh, perhaps we can share them with our with our uh, crew there as well. It is time for Rescue Animal of the Week. It's Cardi P's Rescue Animal of the Week. So the rule is, if you want a rescue animal on this station, on Rescue Animal of the Week, it can be any animal. To this week, it is a dog, and it's called Sky. Tell it is. Sky. Didn't your mother ever tell you not to talk with your mouth full? I, I, look, it, it, was, it was nearly not full. Anyway, tell, okay. tell us about Sky. Uh, this was nominated by uh, 100% Union and uh, from County Durham. Sky is a, a Staffordshire Bull Terrier rescued four years ago uh, from a local shelter. She's now seven and is epileptic. She's apparently the best friend you could wish for. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. We have lovely photos of Sky on the, uh, or have them on the screen a second ago, and I will, of course, put them on my Twitter, at Peter Cardwell, a bit later on. And actually, speaking of rescue animals, as we sometimes do on this station, the RSPCA is warning that animal abandonments are at a three-year high on wanted pets facing a bleak winter, Dave. Yeah, this is uh, basically caused by the COVID-19. There was a surge of people going out and getting animals. Yeah, and they shouldn't And have, now, with the cost of living crisis, now they can't look after them. Yeah. And they're expecting a, a, a huge amount. They said just last month there was 1,800 incidents of abandonment across England and Wales, which is a 48.1% increase. I just, I'm just... Honestly, think that these people should not have got animals. Had they, if they, if you no. got, the, they had the time and space during lockdown, but then they weren't. You know, we was going to go back to normal. It's very, very sad. The RSPCA is asking animal lovers to donate what they can to their winter appeal, which will help the charity care for the animals throughout the colder months. Um, and uh, another, you got a silly weird story for us because apparently Amazon are set to start selling vehicles well, uh, yes. in 2024. Just briefly. So, uh I know rescue centres set up uh, wish, wish lists and on yes, Amazon. Of course. But uh, Amazon, going back to when Howard was in a little bit earlier, Amazon are going to start selling cars from probably, 2020. quite a lot of packaging. I was going to say, I mean, some of the boxes I get are about the size of a car and they've got something the size of a toothbrush. Yeah, no, it's, that's absolutely so true. So what size box is an Amazon car being Well, that's, a, that's a very, very good point, actually. Amazon and Hyundai will work together to create a new generation of in-car infotainment systems as well. Hopefully, Talk TV will be part of that as well. Johnny, you're back. I'm Thank back. you so I'm much for helping earlier on. Rosie R D. Rosie R. Rosie Gould, D. Gould J. That's a well do. LL Gould J. <laughs> LL Gould J. Brilliant. I love it. Love it. Yes. I'll stick with that. Stick my with my that. friend uh, Daniel L. Gamry, I call him the notorious DLG. That's it. And yeah. does it make him feel. He's very cool. straight. He's very straight. Anyway, tell us what is on your I'm show. I'm on Boulevard, <laughs> Peter. 